Sleepers Podcast, happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to March. This is March. Do you have any March-related gimmicks for the people cart? Um, I was born in March, so this is my birthday month. Happy birthday month. Thank you. Are you a person who celebrates the whole month? No, I, I barely even celebrate my birthday. Should I bring a gift to every episode for you? Please do not. I might do that. That might be a bit for the rest of the season. Here's your birthday gift. No, no more. I'm, I think I'm giving up bits in March. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. People like the bits. Uh, this is a big week for us in a variety of ways. May have some announcements later this week. Stay tuned. We're going to a game in person for the first time since the Champions Classic, and it's a big one. Illinois, Purdue in Champaign. Cannot wait. Very excited. See us on Green Street. We'll be there. Do want to do a quick check-in with you on uh, vibes for that trip before we go because – you know, I think a lot of people assumed we would pull up in our orange, our brightest orange for this. I certainly intended to about a month ago, but one of Illinois' star players publicly feuded with us, and a couple of Purdue star players have been privately loving us very respectfully lately in our DMs. So has that changed anything for you on who you're rooting for or how you're operating for this trip? I'm rooting for sleepers. Okay. I'm team sleepers. That's why I am just excited to watch two good basketball teams play against each other. Okay. So you won't be wearing orange. You won't be wearing gold. Nope. No Lance Jones jersey. Nope. No Dane Danger T. Nope. Interesting. Okay. I, I know the Orange Crush were very excited at the thought of maybe getting you in orange since you wouldn't wear it. Well, you took it off last year. Yeah, I don't know if I can be present in the Orange Crush. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I'm excited for this. This should be good. Uh, cams? Are we going to hit cams? Yes. Old or new? Isn't there like an old and new cams? I think so. Yeah. Got to hit cams. Got to hit Murphy's. Got to hit Murphy's. Yeah. My daughter's yeah. named after a champagne bar. Yeah. We do will we do. have to go? Do we got to go back to the merch store? Yes. Over under five ninety nine ninety nine. That was the over under before I hit a bet for twenty k this weekend. So might add a one in front of that. Now I'll see how it goes. Uh, I will be leaving the store with a Dre Gibbs Lawhorn jersey tee. I can promise you that. I'm really excited about it. Okay. Anything else? And do we need to address anything at the top? This is a big show. No. No. Okay. We have like a thousand comments to get to because there's always a lot of comments on the first episode of the week because there was a lot of activity in the Discord over the weekend. Uh, and then after we do all these comments, we're bringing a very special guest onto the show, David Klein, Spartan Hoops DK, aka uh, our friend David Klein. He's been a recurring guest throughout the years in the old versions of the Sleepers podcast. First time he's been on this season, long overdue, but uh, great guy. We got some very fun Big Ten and national march oriented topics for you today and we also had a topic on the future of the michigan state program so that's later in the show we'll bring him on after the comments but uh first to all the discord comments huge weekend in the discord once again cart a bunch of new signups i want to make sure i don't miss any uh big names on my shout outs uh wa9 pie welcome sir frederick the third welcome Coleman's burner joined the discord. Uh, there are allegations. Coleman's burner is Coleman. We haven't confirmed Midwest grind is in the discord. Milty 24 is in the discord. EC is in the discord. Boiler con is in the discord. Spartan BB 79 is in the discord. And uh, just today, this afternoon, right now, coach G eight S is in the discord. That's nine signups in three days. Cart round of applause for the discord. And you are inching closer to your tattoo. I kind of wanted to get the 200 because I kind of want the tat. I really want the tat. I really like, do. Actually, I'm not going to say I'm going to. No, we need 200 signups. That's the only way I get it. I'm not going to not going to cut corners. Okay. Last that I checked, we are at 166 paid Discord members right now, which is incredible. So uh, if you want to join the Discord, uh, we've gone from like saying, hey, join the Discord to support the show. Like that was the primary reason. And it definitely does that. Don't get me wrong. But now it's turned into a thing where like there's actually a lot of fun reasons to join the Discord. <laughs> like there's like 166 people who love Big Ten basketball and the sport as a whole as much as we do. 
Like the the Kentucky fans in our Discord are insane right now. I get so much entertainment just watching Sully and UK freak out in the final four minutes of a Kentucky game. It's really, really fun. Join the Discord. I promise if you're a college basketball fan and you're a fan of the show, you will not be disappointed for 10 bucks a month. You should give it a try. Link in the description. And we read every single comment from every single member of the Discord every time a comment is left. Uh, let me find where we left off. Like I said, okay, it starts with Matt F today. Is the who's better Purdue or UConn hypothetical? Is it now annoying to the likes of Jordan versus LeBron that ESPN beat like a 20 year old dead horse? I'd like to think so. Your thoughts. We're doing the one sentence rule today. So this might be a run on in some cases. It is not annoying to me that that discourse is going on. That's part of it. It's annoying that Houston is not a part of that trio mm. Mm. i think it's short-sighted from both purdue and yukon fans and you should be bigger than that but it seems to have died down a little bit in in its place a new way more annoying dialogue boom fizzle 79 says what do you think of the dialogue around connect over Edie for national player of the year I think the only reason that there is dialogue is because Zach Eady has it locked up to the point where you need to do something like that. Like, but connect is clearly number two in the rankings and he shouldn't be ashamed of that at all because it's up against Zach Eady. I don't even think there is a dialogue about connect over Edie. And I'm sorry. I understand there will be Purdue fans who send me screenshots of certain Twitter accounts from Tennessee. Go Vols 42 that say Dalton connect is better that's not a real source. And the same way Purdue fans have encouraged me kindly, which I am trying to take to heart, to ignore certain criticisms, you can do that with people that claim – like nobody reputable in the sport thinks that Connect is over Zach Eady for national player of year. Stop making that a debate. It's not a debate. And the only reason that even took on legs is because 5,000 Purdue accounts – we're interacting with it, calling like two accounts out for being stupid. It's insane. Coleman's burner says, I have seen many crazy cool names this year in CBB. Give me your guys. First team, all American player names this year. We did that on Friday's episode. Go watch it. Coleman's burner, I think is trying to troll us and get us into saying Terrence Shannon. Cause I think he joined after that segment, Illinois fans were very upset with us. Do you have a one sentence comment on us leaving Shannon off the first team, all American list? He missed games. He missed many games. Missed yeah. Many. Yeah. Spartan Dog 101 says, How far in the tournament does this Michigan State team have to go in order to successfully add to the program slash Tom Izzo's legacy? Add to the legacy. They would have to make an Elite Eight. I think they need a Final Four. With this team, though? Like, yeah, but I. I mean, I guess you would remember the year fondly if you make an Elite Eight. I think the same would be it for a Sweet 16. But like like 20 years down the road being like, what was that year? The the A.J. Hogard year? Then, yeah, you need a Final Four to top. Like, this program is elite. You guys have a bunch of Final Fours. You tell me about them all the time. Why why are we lowering the bar now for this team? That's insane. Uh, Coy says, if Gonzaga starts in the play-in game as an 11 seed, are they going to the Sweet 16? And is St. Mary's going to get screwed seeding-wise by the committee? They're currently projected as a six. I don't think St. Mary's will get screwed that bad. I do think that Gonzaga is 100% if they are an 11 seed, which is what they were the last time I looked. They are going to beat the six seed, whoever that is, and I think they are going to make a Sweet 16. Yeah, you're really high on Gonzaga right now. Um, I I understand why. I'm not like super mad at it. They're playing well. I think St. Mary's is screwed by their injuries. That's all I think they're screwed by. Herschel says to add on to this, does Gonzaga even deserve to be in the tournament? Uh, these numbers that he sent about quad one wins were before their win over St. Mary's. Given the win in the fashion it was against St. Mary's, yes, they deserve to be in the tournament. Um, scrolling further. Dr. Doctor says, what size candy stripe pants should Bruce Pearl buy? And what golf course should Woodson become a member at? I don't think Mike Woodson golfs, for one. And two, Bruce Pearl's not coming to Indiana. Indiana fans seem to think you could be wrong on that. And Woodson definitely golfs, by the way. You you, that's a that's a crazy misread by you. Yeah. How, how do you figure that? Where, where, where do we come to that? I, I don't know. We're going to have to do some fact checking on this. But, like, I'm... 
I'm highly confident that Mike Woodson golfs and is like a 36 handicap. Do you think I could beat Mike Woodson in golf? With your new clubs. <laughs> May I need I need to see you with the new clubs. I'm gonna re- reserve commentary until I see you with the new clubs. By the way, see the new clubs behind you right now. My babies in the crib. <laughs> it's always something in your shop behind you, man. Uh Purdue Boiler with a fun question. Carter, what's the best game you ever had when you played basketball? Hmm. You know, I never had just like a crazy like scoring output in college. Like I didn't have like a 27 point game or anything like that. Anything like that cool. Um the first one that came to mind was my first college start um as a freshman against Wisconsin Platteville, which is like the school that Bo Ryan used to coach at, really good D3 basketball team. And I had 17 and 11, and I was talking so much shit, Gregory, that I was just, it was just, it was amazing. It was, it was truly amazing experience. And I was cooking and I was like looking at, and they had an older dude starting at center. I'm like, this dude like can't fuck with me. Like I was, sorry, excuse my language, but I was letting them have it. I need the tape of that game, first of all. I'm sure it was a masterpiece. I also feel insanely slighted that Purdue Boiler didn't ask for my best game that I ever played or at bare minimum the best game I ever coached. Like, come on, throw me a bone. UK says, just lost in the grade school Final Four as an assistant. I'm crushed. And as I walked out of the gym, me and the coach got referred to as Rick Barnes in March and Shaka Smart when it matters. One kid had 27 of the 29, connect level performance. Not sure where to go from here. Some are questioning my acumen when the lights are bright. Might not be able to show face again in this city. Listen, man, grade school playoffs, that's where the greats become great. I'm telling you right now. Like, I, I don't want to make you feel worse, UK, but every good coach that's had a run somewhere cuts their teeth on CYL basketball, Catholic youth league, fifth through eighth grade, work your way up the ladder. And uh, yeah, no disrespect. Like I didn't have championship years year in and year out in those ranks, but I'd be lying if I looked this Zoom call in the eyes and said I didn't once drive an hour and a half, six times a week, just to drag Josh Kramer and the boys three games through the playoffs to an 11 and 0 undefeated season. And the picture on my fridge is my certificate of excellence as a coach. Shout out to Kramer. Special. Draymond Green back in the day. Now he just – he's always unavailable when you ask him to hoop. I'm a little concerned. Yeah. Uh, Guy says, what are your guys' favorite islands? I just listed over 50 islands. None of them were Tortuga Island. Melba tried to convince me it was real. I think I know every island in the world. Oh, I just remembered the Isle of Man. Also, what do you think about Rudolph's shiny New Year feature on the Year Without a Santa Claus DVD? I'm getting worried about Guy. Yeah, me too. And that joke about him using WD-40 as chapstick might actually be true, and it, the fumes might be getting to him. Uh, but to make it very clear, the two best islands <laughs> are the Galapagos Islands and Madagascar. My favorite island is uh, when you get a very slow-footed guard switched onto you, and yeah. you call that out. Isn't that's, that's my a, favorite that, island? That is a nice island. Travis Nelson says my hot take is that Doug is actually smart, and his ineligibility was all effort-related and not intellect. Also, that would be the perfect homage to his play as of late. I kind of agree with that. I'm not going to comment on my point guard's academic issues that are very real. Sir Frederick the third says, I have no idea where I'm supposed to post this in the discord, but I think it's time to have an Edie versus connect for national player of the year discussion. Edie is clearly more dominant by the way that teams legitimately game plan around him. Connect might be the best pure scorer in college basketball that we've had since Kevin Durant's days at Texas. Edie is much more of a two-way player. Uh, very long, good comment from Purdue fan, Sir Frederick III, who's new to the Discord. Uh, do you have any thoughts? We're, th- this area is not where we're going to do this Connect versus Edie thing. It's Edie. Yeah. 
that might be a topic later in the week if this actually still remains a thing. I've been trying to avoid it, but if we do have the discussion when we get there, our thoughts are going to be that it's just Edie. Let's stop making this a discussion. Purdue Boiler 83 says, uh, when Carter said he was 6'7 with a strong right hook, I knew both weren't true. I thought he probably had a good right hook, but was closer to 5'9, but he's really 6'7, so now it leaves me questioning the right hook. If we can't get a slipper flip, I'd like to get some air boxing. Let's see the hook. You could, you could just see me at the sleepers meetup. And you can see the hook there? Yeah, I'll fight anybody. Uh, got it. Okay. Trent Frazier is GOAT. Says, think Shannon has a stronger argument for being on the first team than third. He's averaging greater than 25 points per game in his last five or six. His numbers across the board are better than Connect. If he plays all the games this year, is he first team? Hard to listen to that segment. Thought Carter and Greg were TSJ guys, but the Connect hype has gotten to them. Oh, well. DSJ missed a month of basketball. And also, Dalton Connect is better than TSJ this year. Like, what are we doing? I, it, They're both great players, but, like, I mean, I, I just don't know what we're doing here. Connect's on the team. This isn't Shannon versus Connect. Why does every fan base want to make it versus Connect right now? Connect yeah. is on the first-team All-American team. He's not the National Player of the Year. He's on the first-team All-American team. This would be Terrence Shannon over Jamal Shedd, who just hit a game-winner or over Tyler Kolick, which actually might be a fair argument because Tyler Kolick's now missing some time. Marquette looked pretty good without him. Look, if Shannon played the whole season, I think he's a no-brainer first-team All-American. The reality is that players who miss a month of the season due to a rape charge typically don't become first-team All-Americans. So uh, I appreciate the thoughts that he's averaging 25 points in his last five or six games. All-American teams aren't based on your last five or six games they're based on based on what you did the entire season which included a month where he was suspended due to a rape charge so i I, like we've done all the dialogue that we can on that we want to talk about how great he is you don't get season long awards for that you just don't and we put him on the third team i honestly thought that was fair we didn't put kevin mccullough on the third team and uh by the way the the last thing his numbers across the board are better than connect no they're not (laughs) <laughs> They're not like I, go. you can go look at the if you ignore both percentages and go off like a point six points per game increase and nothing else. I, and there are other things Shan's better at. Shan's a better defender. But goodness, guys, like he's not just a no brainer better than Dalton Connect with defense. It's insane. Malik Perry says, if this year's March Madness had the most upsets, would you be surprised? P.S. Don't do anything if Michigan State wins another game. Just keep the same energy. <laughs> I will always keep the same energy about this Michigan State team. I think I've decided I'm going to go to the senior night game. I think I'm going to go. I can't pass up the possibility of Boudarius Bowie. Um, also, I feel I think I can say this safely on the show. Um, I was sending you screenshots of this the other other day. My father-in-law, who I love, shout out TP, is a fan of this program, is a diehard Michigan State fan, love him to death, and uh, – He's been chirping me a little yeah. bit. I like I, I don't text Terry Patterson too much. Like we're in group text, but we, we don't do too much one off texting. He's more of a phone call guy. About midway through every Michigan game the last couple of weeks, I've been noticing I get a couple texts, a couple strings of texts from TP, which I greatly appreciate for my eight and twenty basketball team. Uh so I just like to read a couple texts from TP on the program. Uh he says. Uh, he sent me a screenshot of him betting. He bet $5 on Michigan Moneyline to beat Rutgers. Said, Dougie back on the road. I'm sure those grades are up to par. Then immediately after the game starts, says, early report says my UM bet was very stupid. I can't lose. I'll spend $5 any time to see Michigan lose. Then I got commentary from him throughout the game that said, is this the UM JV team? Ha, 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 ha. Seven laughing emojis. One last jab. I think Orchard Lake St. Mary's would beat UM. It's a shame when Mighty Michigan won't even be invited to the CBI tournament. Getting close to my 30-point victory wish. These are all texts I got. I sent one (laughs) response in the thread. So, uh, Cart, you know what I did this morning? What did you do? I, I made a phone call. Oh, God. I made a little phone call to my beloved father in law TP. You know what I did? What'd you do? Asked him if he wants to come to the senior night game with me in East Lansing Wednesday night, 7 p.m. Thought that'd be fun. Little little son and father-in-law, little date, little experience. Should be fun, right? Go green, go white, woof, woof. 
Little does he know that Boo Darius is stepping into that gym. He probably doesn't even know who Boo Darius is. Boo Darius, mind you, a pissed off Boo Darius coming off the Iowa loss, a Northwestern team that now suddenly feels that they need to get this game. They wouldn't be feeling that way prior to this game. But you now have a pissed off Boo Darius stepping in to this gym. Northwestern has only lost two straight games once this entire season. Great bounce back team on AJ Hogarth senior night. So yeah, me and me and TP father in law have a nice little outing, and I might just be wearing the Boudarius jersey, waiting to scream in his face the entire time that Boot dismantles this program. Uh, okay, any thoughts? I love TP, but he kind of would deserve that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert Jones, super fan, says. Uh, Actually, I don't know who who's Robert Jones super fan. Do we have a new member? Is that, I think it might be a new member, and I think Robert Jones is a center for Iowa State. Robert Jones super fan, welcome to the Discord. I don't remember if we, we yeah, maybe you changed your name. We maybe that's the guy. Iowa State because we said Corey Lucius, Iowa State, Michigan State fan. Uh, uh yeah, we might have missed the shout out to Robert Jones super fan, or he changed his name. But he says, "Who wins in an anything goes cage match? Carter with Greg on his shoulders, or Greg with Carter on his shoulders?" I don't think that Greg could hold me on his shoulders. I'm a, uh, so I'm a massive human being. His answer is my money's on Carter with Greg on top. Bottom Carter would be throwing body shots in the kidney at top Carter. Okay. Don't ever refer to me as bottom Carter ever again. Okay, Robert. So the only thing is in this setup, I'm going to be worthless on both sides. I don't like, I'm, I'm just worthless in a fight other than verbally. I feel like you could do some damage though. Like you're on my shoulders. You throw a kick maybe. Uh, but I down. think it like, if it's, if we just get it to the point where like, I can actually hold you on the shoulders and the bottom guys aren't doing anything physical to each other. They're just focused on holding. It's like a chicken it, fight. Yeah. And it becomes top Carter versus top Greg. I think top Carter destroys top Greg. I agree. I agree. Maybe I, this, this top and bottom conversation has me uncomfortable. I'd like to move on. I really enjoyed that. What a first comment from Robert Jones, super fan. Uh, a lot of good dialogue on that, by the way, from other people with their thoughts on this. Mohill 93 says, I stand by your one big thing, Greg. I also must tell you though, I'm the guy rocking shorts unless it's under 10 degrees. I know I'm going to be inside most of the time. I'm trying to be comfortable or, uh, sorry, I'm trying to be comfortable, not stylish or look a fool. Sweats are more comfortable than shorts. Mm. Went to the park today in shorts. It was lovely. It was beautiful. I'll I'll, I'll let you get away with that because isn't it like 60 something? 70 today. Is okay. The shorts are fine. Yeah, yeah. Guy says, reminder that Deron Holmes the second is the second best college basketball player. Did he send this after Dayton's loss to Loyola? Uh, yeah, he did. When Deron Holmes was the second second was maybe the second best player on the floor. Mm. In Tough. that Anything, yeah. yeah, tough luck. Coleman Spurner says, if both you guys had to survive on an island together for three months, what 10 items would you bring combined? Five per person. You would have to kill to get food. Uh, you would have to build your own shelter. You wouldn't be able to bring anything that would allow you to leave the island. What's your strategy? How quickly do you turn on each other? What do you bring? So we both get to bring five things to try to survive. Okay. So we got to kill to get our food. So I'm recommending that... If it's allowed, I'd like to bring a gun. I'd like to bring a gun. So here's my only thought on the gun. I'm afraid of you and I alone on an island with three months with one gun. What, like you'd shoot me? I'm not saying that. I might be saying I don't trust you alone with me on an island with a gun as we like both get hungrier and hungrier and scared. Okay, but we need some type of weapon, though, to kill for food. If we're bringing one gun, we're bringing two guns. Because if you're going to have a gun, I have a gun, too. So we're going to use two items that, so that we both have a gun? It, it's either no guns or two guns. What do you want? Okay, fine. All right, so two guns. There goes two of our items right there. So <laughs> both of us have to have guns. Uh, some type of Wi-Fi, like router. I need Wi-Fi. I need, I need Wi-Fi. Okay, um, so if we have that, then we also need phone and or... 
laptop, probably laptop, so we can pod. Do we just bring pod uh, equipment? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so microphone, webcam. <laughs> I'm gonna need a ring light. <laughs> I'm saying just be yeah. Our pod set, our pod set up, our phones, and gun each, and then we'll be okay. That's so funny, but it's so true. It, I, it'd be great, and we had the Wi-Fi. We could throw on some games. Um, my, own, my only other one I would add, I I would actually like burn to death if I didn't bring sunscreen. See, but the thing is, if we're stranded on the island, I think your body composition and skin would adjust to like that the the direct sunlight and rays. Like you wouldn't, no. you would eventually become, you know, a one with the rays. No, I would burn to death. I'd have to be in shade the whole time. Okay. All right, sunburn is definitely a a mental hurdle, but I will allow us to bring sunscreen. I don't think it is because there's pretty visible signs of your skin burning. You're talking to someone who I literally, I just, I go outside and I lay out and I say, just don't get sunburn, and I don't. You're black. I can still get sunburn. I'm white, and my mom had stage four melanoma. Okay, so we got to bring sunscreen. <laughs> Come on. All right, uh, sunscreen, sunscreen it is. So okay, if I'm bringing sunscreen, you get one more item then of pleasure. <laughs> Shit. Gun, gun, sunscreen, pot equipment. <laughs> you get one other thing. Honestly, like maybe like a big floaty or something. So we in the water. It's just like a, like a one of those floaty beer pong tables. <laughs> yeah, either that. I was thinking that or a pontoon boat. Mm. just like actually if, I, a, if we could bring a boat <laughs> right like we're not getting off the island but like you piss me off like you're chirping you're like yeah michigan state here they go losing again Mighty's the starting center i'm just going to the pontoon to get my space oh i meant more for just like fun let's go take a cruise <laughs> i've never had a bad time with you on a boat that's very true love a good pontoon one last thing i'd like to propose maybe bring could we both bring our dog my dog wouldn't make it. My thought was that we could one convince our dogs to get over hating each other, and two, uh, maybe we could could train our dogs to hunt. Like, could our dogs become fishermen for us? Ooh, that'd be kind of nice. Then we could, yeah, that was because we're not gonna be able to shoot fish with our guns. They're gonna have to be the masters of the water. Yeah, to handle all land stuff. Right. So I'm I'm thinking, gun, gun, dog, dog, sunscreen. Do you want a floaty or a boat? Let's go with boat. A boat, sunscreen, boat, and then pot equipment. Yeah, that's all we need. <laughs> and we would not turn on each other, I don't think. No. Uh, yeah, the, the Coleman Spurner says he thinks we would we would start fighting after one week. I don't think so. No. No, we'd be good. I've never really been like truly upset with you ever. I don't think I've ever been truly upset with you either. Yeah, can't imagine. We we spent a lot of time together too. Like, actually, you know what? We did have one moment when we tried to record after that Purdue game when we were in Mackey, and you had just got your heart ripped out. And if that footage ever got released, uh, <laughs> we we were trying to make a pod, and we just realized we were just chirping each other. We turned it off. Yeah, but that was even like like that was bad, and that was entirely on me because I was in my feelings over getting chirped. Uh, and my team going to the NIT back when I still thought I was an NCAA tournament team. Like, I had to deal with a lot that night. Yeah. And also, like, Harry's Chocolate Shop kicked me out for being too celebratory. That was crazy. That was, crazy. That was really um, crazy. So, yeah, I that was on me. And then we immediately went to Applebee's and got an offer from Bleacher Report. So things things turned up right away. Okay. okay. Oof, oof, oof. Sorry. Uh, good question, though, from Coleman's Burner. Uh, let's fly through everything else here. UK says, does Dayton stink? Yes, they stink. Guy says, if you answer yes to the question above, I'd watch your back. What are you going to do, Guy? You're a high school kid in California, and I'm a grown adult in Michigan. Like, it, it, really? Also, yeah. I, now that I challenged Guy, I feel like I actually do need to watch my back. <laughs> he might do something great. Travis Nelson says, is Deron Holmes just tall? Uh, no, Deron Holmes is good. Dayton stinks. Yeah, not good. Do you want Malik Perry's answer to the what would he bring to the island question? No. Gun, a lot of ammo, good knife, all weather clothes, a good durable big tent. <laughs> and then he left another comment that says, 
a lot of ammo again. <laughs> Carter Bullhouse says, will MSU be stubborn and keep Izzo for five more years than miss out on Drew Valentine? What are the chances Drew is Michigan State's next head coach? Uh, that's a, we, we did a video on it with some more deeper thoughts on that, that I think kind of answer a lot of this. Well, with that said, a lot of the coaching thing is how timelines line up. And, you know, there's a lot of dominoes that could fall between now and then if Drew is going to be the next Michigan state head coach. Uh, but simple answer, I would love for him to be the next Michigan state head coach. Yeah. I, I think it's at least like a 25% chance, but I'm not sure the timing is going to add up nicely. I did, uh, I mean, we're in some of those group chats with the national guys, and I was floating Drew's name. And uh, there was one potential destination that I really liked that friend of the show threw out. And uh, I'm going to keep it private, but it's a power five job that could come available very soon that is nowhere near Michigan State. And I think he'd crush it there. Uh, okay. Ryan Lyon, any surprises in the updated Discord MVP rankings? Yeah, I don't know why Sleepers Mal, a.k.a. my wife Mal, is on here at all. She has like three Discord comments ever, and she's 14th in the rankings. Yeah, just, just that's just that's nepotism. Yeah, like I appreciate the kindness of anybody that voted for her, but like let's hold our people accountable. She can't be missing box outs. Coleman's Burner says, thoughts on Illinois being 9-0 and when Justin Harmon scores 10-plus points? I mean, I've always said that Justin Harmon is a, a great piece to have off the bench. So uh, I, I think he can solve some of those point guard issues that they have. I will be referring to Justin Harmon as Jeremiah Lloyd Harmon for the remainder of the season. Is that his name? Jeremiah Lloyd Harmon. Uh, Sully, CBB is insane. Go WWE. Says rank the four bigs on Kentucky. Big Z, Bradshaw, Hugo, and Mitchell. How should they split up the minutes for them going forward? I think I'd go Z, Mitchell. Big O Bradshaw. I don't get why Bradshaw has been the worst. Like I, I still believe in his talent, either the most or the second most here. And mm -hmm. I think Bradshaw's like best game where he was really good against Florida at the end of it was like, like eye popping to me in a way I've never seen from you go. Um, with that said, I would give big Z 25 minutes a game. I would give, I guess, Ugo, 10 minutes and then I would go super small outside of that. I would not have Bradshaw in the rotation. I would not have Mitchell in the rotation. Wow. Mitchell not even in the rotation, huh? Yeah, I'm convinced that Mitchell is like part of the problem. That's hmm. for another day and another conversation. But like, oh, we're in a dogfight at home with Arkansas. Why? Oh, Trey Mitchell's also back for the first time in a month. Why? Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, huh. Interesting. Um, UK says the other day, my grandma was in the grocery store in Champaign. And when she was disrespectfully cut in line by none other than Coleman Hawkins, mind you, she is 50, sorry, she is 85 and has a bad hip and can only stand for so long. She asked Coleman why he did that. And he turns around and screams in her face because I'm a two time champion, you old hag and gives her a little shove. I mean, he is a two time champ. See, we've reached the point of the season where the Discord is realizing they can just write whatever they want and we read it. It's not even a question at this point. It's just like, I'm going to make these people read this. I I don't mind it. It's entertaining. Ryan Lyon says the same thing happened to my grandma. It's a damn shame. Luckily, my grandma was able to walk right by him, though, because Coleman Hawkins jumped on her first step. <laughs> <laughs> That's really well played, Ryan. That is very Good well job. played. Uh, Jack MCM says, why is AJ Hogart only good against Illinois? Is he good against Illinois? He's not. That's my answer. Sean Vowell says, I think it needs to be said. Is anyone actually good? Yes. This Definitely good. good. Definitely yeah. good. Good. Yes. Good. Yeah. Malik Perry says a good five or a good one. Carter, give me a good five, but you still got initials as your one. We would be way better with a good one. P.S. I've been drinking. Hope initials don't start on senior night. I, I'm pretty sure that the senior is going to start. Uh, the senior starting point guard has been starting every single game the past three years is going to start. I would I would put that as a pretty uh, evident fact. Um. Yeah. Malik, I love you, brother. Keep fighting the good fight. 
I love Malik so much, man. Like everybody else is either like writing their jokes or asking real questions. And like Malik just has like seven comments interspersed throughout hours and days apart from each other that are all just like ramblings about Michigan State or gun ammo that have nothing to do with each other. I love it so much. Uh, Travis Nelson said, I understand that teams win in different ways, but is Edie being so good just an even bigger indictment on Izzo not going after a transfer big? No, no, I just think the indictment of it is just how the team like runs and operates. I don't think you have to look to any other teams as far as like going up against them to to put that up. I just think that some of the offensive ineptability, I guess, if that's even a word, is based off the fact that the center position is a complete zero, a negative. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think they're necessarily overly connected. I will say as far as like ED success and Purdue success, I wish tremendously that Beeline with his stretch five run would have been against Zach ED because Beeline and Painter had some really fun face offs. Honestly, Beeline got the better of him a good amount when he was spacing out like Isaac Haas and AJ Hammonds back in the day. Um, they were, but they was always very good teams. I would love to see, like, what does a Mo Wagner good Michigan team do to Zach Eady Purdue? Like, I don't think they'd be able to guard it, and I think it would probably be a really high-scoring game both ways, but uh, there's nobody in the league trying to do that, except for Illinois, which is coincidentally the only team that is even approaching Purdue in the Big Ten standings. So um, last thing from Travis Nelson, he says, it turns out that the ride that Greg went on that set on fire was the WAP experience. You know, I, I, sorry, all the pain of this season just set in, just like hearing that WAP is such a trigger word for me now. I can't even do it. It gets so much more painful to me having to do my whole thing, watching you and your fan base act like you're the miserable ones. Because I don't even, like, at least you have, like, a community to get miserable with. There's, like, three members of the Discord that are Michigan fans with me. I don't even know any other Michigan basketball fans and nobody cares. I just have to be miserable by myself in isolation. And while my team's like 20 games worse than yours here, you cry about being a 10 seed boo who man, like, God damn. Dylan Terpstra says boo booey against Michigan state versus Michigan state in a must win. And AJ Hogard on senior night, two unstoppable forces. It's a pissed off boo booey. That's the only thing you got to remember. Yeah, I, I can't wait to bet Northwestern. Coy says there needs to be a conversation about what the hell Virginia is doing after this season. In four of their last five games, they haven't broken 50 points. The one they did, they still lost to Boston College. Didn't they beat Boston College? Uh, I'm not positive about that, but in regards to Virginia, I'm very interested to see like where that program goes. I mean, I, to my knowledge, they don't have really have much recruiting going on right now um tony bennett isn't like a portal master or anything of of that sort and like guys like beekman are moving on ryan dunn will probably move on like i just don't know virginia might be one of those programs that college basketball might be passing up yeah uh i still believe in tony bennett for the record but they did beat boston college coy's wrong on that one um Offense is bad, though. Offense is very bad. Malik Perry says, I know that Michigan State has had a long downtrend this last four or five years, but last night I saw hope in this team. If Booker has a strong offseason to the point that he can play 25 minutes, would you rather get any three 2025 recruits or the three best transfers? And then he also wants us to know, I will be giving away awards before March Madness. Ooh. Well, if I get the three best 225 recruits, that means I get Cooper Flagg and Ace Bailey and Dylan Harper. I want those. I don't think those guys would make a better basketball team than the three best transfers. You'd have to see the transfers are probably, though, right? Okay, but let's just play it this year. Hunter Dickinson, Baylor Shireman, and Mark Sears. Okay, yeah. Even though Sears and Shireman, this is their second year, so it'd be, it'd be even better. Be Connect, Dickinson, and shit. I don't know. Any any other tra- Okay, yeah, maybe it'd be the transfers. Yeah, I. 
get good 22 year old players while you can do yeah. that. Um, two more comments. Then we get to the show with DK Jay Cohen, 77, uh, who is our first Northwestern fan, by the way, I don't think we shouted you out. Uh, speaking of our love for Budaria, shout out to Jay Cohen. He says, what's the best game of college basketball that you've ever been to or watched in the last few years? Ooh. Best game I've been to slash watch was probably that North Carolina Duke game with the Caleb Love shot. Great game. That was that was incredible. Yeah, really great game. Um it's hard for me to not just pick something from the last couple final fours. Um I've been blessed enough to work them the last couple of years with the field of 68 and got gifted some pretty special games last year. The San Diego state buzzer beater to beat Florida Atlantic was insane. Uh, didn't feel real watching it play out North Carolina Duke with coach K's career on the line was insane. And walking around in the tunnels after while coach K is literally like on a golf cart driving away for the very last time with his wife, like images I'll never get out of my head. Um, I feel like the real fan question that doesn't cheat the question though, is uh, the Michigan, Kansas, or sorry, not Michigan. I wasn't at that game. Michigan, Kentucky elite eight game where Aaron Harrison hit the shot. That was, that was a great game. I was so heartbroken. So heartbroken. The why? Yeah. I watched Dowskis walk to the tunnel. I'm like, damn. That just – that crushed me. Jake Bridges has our last question of the day. Rank the following fun-to-watch but can struggle defensively teams in terms of how you feel about them potentially making a March run. Kentucky, Baylor, Illinois, and Alabama. Kentucky, Baylor, Illinois, Alabama. Illinois will be last on the list because I think they are the worst defensive team on those teams that you just named. Um I think for me, it go Kentucky, Bama, Baylor, Illinois. Okay. I'm very different than you. Um, I'm also fascinated that you just took Bama over Baylor when later in the show you take Baylor over Alabama. I mean, that's <laughs> – yeah, yeah. Yeah, no spoilers. But um, I'm going to do this very simply – in March, I want a team that has multiple guys that can beat you and win you a March game individually. I think that Baylor has half a one in Ray J. Dennis. I trust them the least. I think Bama has one in Mark Sears. I trust them the second least. I think Illinois has two, Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damask. No disrespect to two-time champion Coleman Hawkins. Uh, I would put them second. And then Kentucky would be my the team I trust the most with – Dillingham, Shepard, Wagner, and everyone else on that roster. Reeves, like they got star power everywhere. Yeah. What's your... Yeah. Fun question. All right. Wow. Get ready for a long episode. Take your halftime intermission. Thank you to the comment section for a great job uh, over the weekend. We had a blast. Join the Discord, subscribe, support the show. We now welcome onto the show David Klein. Okay. Long overdue. We welcome to the show David Klein. Spartan Hoops DK on Twitter, friend of the program. He's been on here a bunch with us in the past. Uh, we've collaborated, the three of us, in a variety of ways. Now you can catch some of DK's work along with Carter Elliott's work over at Spartan Rivals. They've been doing a great job covering this program's ups and downs this season. Uh, we do have the Michigan State recap already up on the channel. So DK is going to join for this entire full episode of the Sleepers podcast. We won't do anything too granular on the Michigan State Purdue result. But we do have a Michigan State topic that we'll save for last later in the show. So if you're coming for DK's Michigan State thoughts, don't worry. We'll get to those. DK, welcome back, my friend. How are you? Oh, so glad to be joining you guys. It's been a little while. Obviously, uh, up and down season. Cart's been hurting lately. So I'm here to lend some moral support for my uh, fellow Spartan dog over there. It, it's it's just completely unfair that every time DK is coming on here, like I still, I, I like I'm not even making this up. I still remember the first one that we did. I think it was before Iowa or maybe after the Iowa game. And we were talking about, man, like what's the, we, I think the little thing we said is what's this big man rotation going to look like after Xavier Tillman leaves or something like that. And now we find ourselves in this spot and uh, you know, not much has changed about a year or two later. So that's just dandy for us. Hey, you never know what's in store. There's still weeks left in the season. Are either one of you guys going to be at senior night, by the way, Wednesday night against Northwestern. I'm debating going, but 
I don't know. I am out of town for work, so I cannot swing that. Um, Got it. Just Greg, are you going? Are you going to plan on going from Champagne right to El the next day? Uh, yeah, that was my thought. Um, I mean, look, it's Boo Darius on AJ Hogarth's senior night, and like <laughs> none of us are going to be in the building for that. That seems insane. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to swing it or not yet, but I would like to. Anyways, that's not what the show's about today. Uh, we have three great topics. DK has brought all three of these to the table for us, which I greatly appreciate. Carter doesn't know what they are, which is also fantastic. I love the element of surprise. So uh, let's just jump right into it. We're going to start by doing a snake draft here of teams we think can win the national championship. Uh, this is not Big Ten specific. Otherwise, we would only have one round. Instead, this is every team in the country. Take it for what it's worth. How many rounds do you want to do, DK? What do you think is good? I, You know, I thought maybe three, but I think we should go four. And like I said, with the point system that we set up, then you're taking some picks, maybe some flyers. I don't think there's that many teams that can win the whole thing, but I do think there's some teams that can maybe sneak into the final four and get you some points. So I think maybe four teams apiece would be the fairest way to do it. I love it. Okay, so DK just alluded to a point system. This is what we got written down right now. Uh, one point for a win in the tournament. Uh, or wait, no, sorry. Do they get a point for just making the tournament? Probably not, because every team we're going to draft is in the tournament, right? Yes. Okay, so one point for a win, two points if they make the Sweet 16, four points if they make the Elite Eight, eight points if they make the final four, 16 points if they make the national championship game, and a whopping 32 points if you are crowned the national champion. We will tally this up. We'll make a graphic of it at the uh, end of the show, and then we'll probably revisit the graphic. Depending on who wins, unless DK destroys us, then we'll never let the graphic see the light of day again. Uh, DK, as the guest on the show, uh, you get to pick who drafts in what spot here. Yeah. Yeah, so I I guess I floated the stipulation, too, that UConn and Purdue would not be included because I think that those are clearly the two national contender front runners. Do you still want to roll with that, or do you want to leave them in the field when we're doing this? What are your thoughts on that, Car? I agree they're probably like the two at the top, but I I kind of think Purdue has some holes right now. Yeah, you know what? I, I'm willing to let those two teams get drafted because I think if someone wants to pick them with the first one, that might come back to bite them, to be honest. Ooh. Okay. All right. So there you have it. You can choose from any team that is playing college basketball this season. And uh, DK, assign the order. This will be snake style, so four rounds. It should even out. But uh, do you want the first, second, or third pick? And then where do you want Cart and I to draft? Um, I'm going to make Cart go one, you go two, and I'll do third. Very fair. All right. Floor is yours, Carter. What do you got? The prize topic and the topics of draft and on the first pick. <laughs> I mean, this has got to be – this is actually my worst nightmare via uh, podcast recording. Um, uh, Okay, I'm not even going to be fake strategic about it. Uh, I'm just going to get get going right away. Give me Houston. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Give me Houston. O- over the two that DK opted to potentially remove here, mm-hmm. why why Houston over the, the big two? Just because – even though Purdue and UConn to me are like those two top tier teams, I think that Houston is on that tier with them when Jamal Shedd is playing this way. And honestly, it might be safer than the other two because maybe the ceiling's good with Purdue and UConn, but I I think you can pretty easily pencil Houston into like the Elite Eight at least in a bracket just by their play style and what they do. So yeah, I feel I need a little safe pick at one. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. I, so there is some strategy to this because I'm a, the team I'm about to pick is not my current national champion pick, but just in theory, I couldn't leave both Purdue and UConn to DK on the turnaround. That would be insanity. So I have to pick one and I'm going to pick the defending champs. I think there are less holes in UConn's roster. I think there are less concerns when the lights get bright. Uh, I think their coach is a maniac who's done it before. Yeah, I th- this was my 1A on my board. If I was drafting first overall, I would have picked UConn in the spot. DK to you for two picks. Yeah, this is tougher. After watching that game last night and some of my anger with the way that Edie was getting calls, it's really difficult for me to get <laughs> over some of my pride and be able to suck up and take Purdue, but I think I, I still have to. 
Um, you know, I, I think what you saw last night from that squad is that this is a different shooting team than it was last year. Guys hit open shots. Lawyer, who's been ice cold for several weeks, if not the last month, uh, caught fire. Mason Gillis comes in and gives you two huge threes in big spots when Michigan State's making a push. Uh, Lance Jones didn't really show up, but he has for most of this season. Um, and Braden Smith was just about as good as he could have been last night. Just absolutely phenomenal. So I, I think that there's enough pieces around Edie. I do think that this team has the capabilities of making a deep run. Um, there certainly has been a little bit more flaws the last month. Um, some warts that are kind of sticking out a little bit. Uh, I guess I was surprised that they let Michigan State back in that when they kind of pushed it out to double digits. The fact that Michigan State fought back in. Um, I think it said something about Michigan State, but I think it's maybe said a little something more about Purdue and the way that they've currently been playing. Um, but I, I, just too good to pass up in this spot. And then the second team that I'm going to go with is uh, the Tennessee Volunteers. I just love this team. Dalton Connect, for me, is Damn an it. absolute monster. Um, they defend, and now they finally have a guy that I think can put up 30-plus a night in the tournament. Um, I'm, I'm riding with the Volunteers. I, I, I really like this team. I know it's Rick Barnes. I know the issues in March. I just think that Dalton Connect is going to make this a little bit different from this year. So that's that's the second team I'm going with on the turnaround. Car, right, you said, "Damn it!" Your thoughts? I, I, I because I I knew you weren't going to pick a Rick Barnes team, and I was really hoping Tennessee came back to me. I actually was going to pick Tennessee on the turnaround. Okay. I was. Right. I don't feel yeah. bad then. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I think DK just mastered those two picks. Those are the exact two teams I was hoping one would fall. Um, I, and I think the strategy behind you going third was incredibly smart because to me, I, I do think it's like a top five ish. The fifth team I'm going to add will, will come in a second, but I like them by far the least of the five. And then I think it's wide open. You can make arguments for everybody else. And you got two of the very most solid that leads me to my pick. Uh, by default, I have to pick this team and I, I don't like it, but I think, yeah, I think they're fifth. I think it's Arizona. Um, I look, Caleb Love is going to shoot this team out of the tournament at some point. That's my strong belief. And if he doesn't, then they're going to win a national championship. Like that, that is what it is. Um, but he's really volatile. Like he, but compared to the four teams that we just named, Caleb Love is more prone to single handedly destroying his team's chances. And Arizona fans tell me that's not what happens for the record. I know a lot has been made of like his shot attempts, he shoots 20 plus in all their losses. Arizona fans claim that's not what's happening. They claim like Arizona gets down 10 and then Caleb gets really aggressive because he's trying to shoot them back into the game, not shooting them out of it. I think it kind of goes both ways. Um, regardless, I I think there's fair Tommy Lloyd questions in March still after what happened to them in the first round last year. I think Caleb's really volatile, but talent wise, that's, I mean, there's not any teams that have a better five other than maybe UConn, in my opinion, from from point guard through center. So I'll take Zona. Now the pressure's on cart because this is wide open from here. You could go a bunch of different directions. Very true. Quick question for y'all. Are y'all doing any like seed line watching when you're picking these teams? I haven't. Okay. I just, I just, I, I didn't want to be the guy to overthink it, but, um, oh, I got back to back here, right? You do. Yes. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. I think okay. this is the toughest spot of the draft. This is super tough. I don't know where you're going with this one. I'm excited to see though. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wait, so wait, I before you, before you make a pick card, I don't, I don't want to throw names of teams out that could potentially be on anybody's board, but it, we also all have the same board. So let me just do that. <laughs> there's, there's two teams here that you love. You've been campaigning for all mm -hmm. season long that mm -hmm. are very similar profile wise that if you believe they could actually make runs to the championship game, I think your pick would be both of them back to back yeah. here. I, I'm talking Kentucky and Illinois. Are you going to, I knew you're going to say, I was like, is it blue and orange? Yeah. Like they're basically I, the same team. I, so I, This I is like love. put up or shut up. You claim they're contenders. Like this is the spot. Very true. Very true. But with that said, <laughs> uh, I'm going to take Duke with this pick. Wow. I'm, I'm wow. going to go Duke with this pick. I mean, the, the guard talent is there. Guards win in March. They have a lot of options. Also, like, I think one of my favorite thing about the Duke guards is that they're not all the same. Like, you can get so many different things. Like, you get different things from Roche. You get different things from McCain, Proctor. And then, like, Caleb Foster is, like, the fourth guy who is, like, 
a crazy fourth option as a guard on the team. That's just an embarrassment of riches. The way Mark Mitchell's been playing at the four has been a revelation. Then, like, Flip is just a first-team All-American level talent. Uh, I just – I really like that team. So, I'm going to pick Duke with this pick. And then the second one, I'm going to stay on topic here with coaches who may struggle in March a little bit. I'm going with Marquette. I'm going with Marquette with this pick. I just think that if they can get the other guys to step up, and you saw what they did. yeah, And, yes, it kind of was creating missing shots and Marquette guys maybe playing a little bit better. But if you just get Kolick and Oso doing what they do, and Kolick has the ability to do really crazy things as long as he doesn't jam his thumb or run into A.J. Hogard, I think that this team can make a run. And I'm also doing a little bit of a, a seed line play with this because I personally think like that seven ten line is pretty like weak. So as a two seed Marquette, I'm like I'm banking they're going to get out of the first weekend because I just think that that seven ten is just very weak and they're talented. We'll talk about it in the Marquette recap, but I think uh, I I was very impressed with Marquette without Oso and Kolick. Like I just thought they'd get ran out of the gym, and their their role guys stepped up in a huge way. DK, I'm curious. I know your thoughts on Marquette from texting you about in the season. Would you have picked them at any point in this draft? I think I would have gone later with it, but this is his third pick, so I don't know. I think if Kolek plays up to the level that we've seen him in spots this season, you know, there's some contemplation for that. Um, But I I don't know. I mean, you guys did, you guys did it like a week or two ago. And what did you say the ceiling was for them? I thought it was sweet 16. Didn't you both agree on that? Yeah, I did. That, that Creighton game flipped me a lot. It It was big. It was big. Yeah. 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 Not to, uh, not to just be like Ken Palm advocates, disciples, whatever you want to call it. But like, in theory, this exercise should result in 12 total teams. Marquette is 14th. So they're the first that's been taken that's off the the board of the top 12 available. Um, interesting. I am just surprised because I, I there were teams I circled of like, oh, I wouldn't mind them on my fourth round pick. And I thought Marquette could be one of them for me, knowing I thought DK wouldn't pick them. And then I thought I could get Duke at some point, knowing you wouldn't pick them. <laughs> I'm, I'm shocked you picked Duke second. I... I picked my Duke pick in mind, knowing that you wanted them for sure. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> I, they weren't I coming it. back to you at four for sure. Yeah, they weren't. Okay. All right. Well, uh, this leaves me in another dicey spot. Uh, looking at my board, I'll just name some teams. A uh, couple, couple SEC teams in Auburn and Alabama at the top that the metrics love that I haven't loved this year. Then there's a group of three or four teams that I think have high ceilings, but maybe low floors. Like North Carolina scares me early a little bit. Creighton scares me. Illinois scares me. But if all goes well, they could go really far. I've been gassing up Iowa State all year, but do I really think they can win a national championship? I don't know. I'm going to take my shot while I can. I don't want DK to have two chances at this team. I'm taking the Kentucky Wildcats. Damn it. It's I should have picked them. I shouldn't have let them go. I'm just doing it. I'm just doing it. I uh, I don't know if DK would have picked them or not, but I would have. That would have been my first pick on the turnaround. Okay. okay, I'm good. I'm going boomer bust. I got the two one seeds in UConn and Arizona. Give me Kentucky. Shoot for the moon. Let's see what happens. Man, this is really tough. DK, DK's war room just got thrown for a. Ah, no, it did. <laughs> it did. I love this uh, exercise, by the way. This is such a great, such a great topic. I didn't get to watch a ton of that Kansas Baylor game. Um, I saw that they lost, you know, pretty handedly. I, this rotation is just so short. I don't know. I don't know if I can convince myself. I still think Bill Self is the best coach in America. Um, you know, McCuller came back and played. I don't know how healthy he looked. Did you guys get a look at that game at all? What were your thoughts on that? I thought he looked decent to be honest but okay. yeah, i thought he looked decent too it's it's i, I was interested to get greg's thought because i they're by i don't like i don't like the vibes around kansas right now the vibes are just extremely yeah. off and i don't like it it's a hunter dickinson team with no depth and injuries like <laughs> it's exactly what you'd expect just with bill self coaching and a little more talent Oh my God, this is going to pay me. I don't trust the other two SEC teams. I really don't. I'm not buying Auburn and Alabama, both being top 10 type teams. That's kind of how I feel about it. So do I ride with like the offensive group where you could go 
you know, like Creighton, Illinois, do I like the defensive side? I don't think Iowa State can win the whole thing, but I do think that they could make a deep run. Um, God, this is tough. I am going to take one of the two on this turnaround is going to be Creighton for me. Um, I don't know if they can win the whole thing, but I do think that they're capable of making a final four. Um, and at this point in the, in where we're at, I think that that's kind of what you're looking at who can break through Baylor Shireman continues to impress, uh, Trey Alexander, as you guys have talked about the last few weeks, Steve Ashworth has really started playing much better basketball. I still think they have one of the best defensive centers in the country in Kalkbrenner. Um, I, I think Creighton's got to be on the board. And I guess that would be my more offensive pick. And I think, I mean, I got to do it. I think I'm going to go Iowa State with my fourth team. I just can't let them go by. I, I think they're fun to watch. It's a team that I will be enjoying rooting for. They have some offensive upside. Um, and I think ultimately you want a team where you are pretty comfortable with the floor. And I think that their floor is pretty good basketball as they've proven for most of the season. So uh, I'm going to go those two on the turnaround. It's a really good pick. I like both of those picks. Uh, Card, any thoughts? I'm mm, sorry. I'm very focused on my, on my team right now. <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm just, I'm still livid that I didn't get one of Kentucky or Crate. And that's, that's, that's eating at me right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, if it's funny, if you had like listed these teams out blindly for us and made me select who drafted whose teams, I would have thought my team was for sure DK's team. And I would have thought, uh, or sorry, DK's team was my picks. My team was Carter's picks. And I don't know. I obviously DK wouldn't pick Marquette, so I don't know. But I'm just surprised by how this has landed. Um, okay, that makes this easier on me for what I'm about to do because Creighton and Iowa state were my high floor picks. I was going to pick either of them over North Carolina. And my decision is now between North Carolina and, and Illinois and the team I'm going to pick, which is <laughs> Illinois. I'm picking Illinois. Um, but partially I'm starting to come around on them a little bit more. I have to say my thought process about this team has changed. So I'm curious to see what your, what your reasoning is. Yeah. But partially to piss Carter off, but no, I think, uh, I, I think they, they have really emerged into what I hoped they would emerge into after the Shannon charges dropped. Right. Which was like, Holy shit. Marcus Damask is a dude. And if they get Shannon back and reintegrate him, they're going to have two dudes. And that's how I feel now. Like we, we just saw what Damas did at the Cole center. Um, I, I think he is capable of doing that. Like there, there's going to be an NCAA tournament game this year that Damas can just win for them. And then there's going to be a game that Shannon can just win for them. All the while Coleman Hawkins is like doing good things on both ends. I am terrified of the defense. I, I truly am. I don't think there's an answer for it. Like, it's going to be kind of matchup dependent to me. Like if they play a team that feasts just scoring at the rim, it's going to be like a hundred to 95. But I think the Wisconsin game was a really good example of like, whoever they play has to show up ready to score 90. Mm -hmm. And there, there's just not a lot of teams in the country that are comfortable scoring 90. So I I've spoken about it on the pod a bunch lately. I really believe in this Illinois of all teams is due for a break, man. Like their draws in the NCAA tournament have been insane. Just probability wise. I don't think that can continue forever. And if they get a favorable draw, I think this is by far Brad's best team since the IO and Kofi year together. So I feel good about it. I agree with that. Um, can we all agree that if we got like a four or five matchup, I, I think both are kind of moving up seed lines, but if you got Kentucky versus Illinois in the sweet 16, like how good of a game would that, it would be first to 120. I mean, it would be an NBA game. It'd be, it'd be awesome to watch. So yeah. I'm kind of willing that into existence, even though that would probably hurt you. So, <laughs> but I, I agree with you. I think the Damask and the reintegration of TSJ, right? Like, We've seen him kind of blow up and Damask has taken a little bit of a backseat. And now I think they're finding their rhythm where both guys can kind of pass it back and forth. You have this like explosive athlete that gets out in transition. And then when you get settled in the half court, you have this guy that's just like really capable of creating a mismatch in that mid post area, getting to his spots. 
he's just so smooth, man. He's just really, really smooth. And, you know, I, I think that they have enough pieces around it to make it run. Um, you know, and like you said, they're kind of the ones that have been dictating the tempo. They're changing um, what defenses are doing to them and they're requiring other teams to score up to their offensive ability rather than, you know, dictating that their pace has to be somewhat slowed down. So um, I think that you have to score a lot of points to beat them. And right now they're playing pretty good basketball. I, I really wasn't buying them after that Michigan State loss. Um, you let Michigan State, this team that's struggled like tremendously score 88 points on you like that to me just sent like alarm bells ringing through my head um but i think that they've maybe shored up some of it by just proving how dominant they can be offensively and to close the year so yeah yeah the wild thing too and then we'll throw it a cart um like if you go back through the game logs from illinois obviously the the losses the michigan state one you mentioned was baffling in in a couple different ways but um like they're, they're two losses since the end of january are at Michigan State at the Brez in a game where, again, they were up two possessions with just a few minutes left, and then the miracle loss to Penn State where they were up eight with a minute left. Like, yeah, prob- probability-wise, they had like a 90% chance at one point to win both of those games. They let it slip. I think they fixed some of the late late game issues as evidenced by Wisconsin, but there's a world like that is not that crazy where Illinois has won like 12 straight games in conference play, and uh, everybody's talking about them completely different. All right, Cart. Hanging in there without Illinois or Kentucky, those are your two loves, and I just stole. Yeah, them. you know what? The fact that I'm I didn't get that is gonna influence my next pick and give you all a little peek behind the curtain here. Um, I was actually considering seriously picking the Zags with this pick because if they end up being like a, I don't even know what it, what the last. I think the last one I looked at was like them as an 11 seed that might be going up now after the win at St. Mary's last night, but like they're packing up like a six seed Wisconsin, like in the first game, that's one win. And then who who knows what the second game looks like. Uh, but I, I'm not going to be able to feel good inside if my team doesn't have some type of bona fide offensive just punch team on it. So for that fact, I'm picking Baylor with this pick. I'm picking Baylor. The guard play is there. If Ray J. Dennis cannot turn the ball over, he's one of the better point guards in the country. Obviously playing the what if game is not what you should do at times, but like, they have Ray J. Dennis. They have Jacoby Walter, who is a bona fide first round NBA draft pick, maybe lottery pick, whoever, whoever you're looking at. Jay Nunn is really solid. Jalen Bridges kind of just ties everything together. Should be a Spartan dog. We're not going to speak on that. He would look really good. Um, and then Misi is just like this defensive, and now he has some offensive game as well. There's just like potential oozing out of him. And then Scott Drew is Scott Drew. So like, give me a great coach right there. So yeah, I think I'm going to go with Baylor for my last team pick. Baylor over UNC. No no RJ Davis for Ray J Dennis? Uh, because, no, because when they uh you know, when Armando Baycott shoots four times and they lose <laughs> and Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram combine for two for 17 from 3, I I just don't see it. Okay. All right. DK, any thoughts on Baylor? Yeah, that I guess, you know, you were looking at offense and you skewed going from Alabama. I guess the defense maybe shakes you off for that, but the number one offense in the country. Um, so definitely some SEC like bias here. I don't think that we particularly like it. And I, I, I think maybe the top part of it is as good a basketball as you can really find in the country. But I guess the trust level with maybe some of the teams is not as high. Um, and I think that's that's kind of interesting coming coming from us. So um but i you know i mean played a good game yesterday like i said against kansas at home um i think that they've kind of started figuring it out a little bit this last like two three weeks of the season and i don't think you can go wrong with scott drew so uh, i i don't hate that pick at all yeah okay uh so to summarize the biggest teams that none of the three of us selected uh alabama and auburn who are eighth and sixth on ken palm respectively North Carolina at nine, we did not select. And then the only other one that's outside the top 12 that I think deserves a shout, DK mentioned, uh, Kansas. Just anytime you could choose Bill Self in the NCAA tournament. And we went through 12 combined teams without it. That might be something we regret. Reading the teams in final here, Carter ended up with Houston, Duke, Marquette, and Baylor. I ended up with UConn, Arizona, Kentucky, and Illinois. My team's either going to be out the first weekend or <laughs> feeling really good. And DK's is Purdue, 
Tennessee, Creighton, and Iowa State. Uh, I really like DKs. I think it's a very high floor team. I love Greg's team just because <laughs> <laughs> just because Illinois, Kentucky. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, my friend. All right, uh, fun exercise. We will we'll make some sort of graphic for that, and then we'll come back to that throughout the NCAA tournament. That will be fun. We have another hypothetical game to play here. Uh, and I I think collectively, if we can't get to the end of this and feel like we're mission accomplished, then we have failed. I'm just setting this up like this. We have to build an eight-man roster from Big Ten players with the goal of winning a national championship. So any eight players you want, Big Ten Conference, but we need to go out and beat the Yukons, the Houstons of the world. Uh, DK, I do want to ask you this. Are we allowed to pick more than one player per team? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right. I, I do think that we should try to keep our best to do it semi-positionally. I know some guys can kind of move up and down, um, but I, I, you know, I think that we try to look at each position that we're placing in and trying to fit somebody in that may, like, I guess I, w- I wouldn't say we can play four guards around the center. Like I'd like to have like a wing forward type mixed in there, at least at one spot. That's my probably, general. Probably, probably depends who the coach is. This is, oh, I could throw Edie at the two. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Uh, okay, I like this. This works. So let's just start at point guard. We'll work our way through a starting five and then talk bench pieces here. Um, or should we start with like the obvious? Like or we're taking Zach Eady, right? Yeah, I think yeah. Zach Eady and TSJ are the two guys that I would pencil in. Um, okay. The spot of where we place TSJ, you know, I think I would put him at the three. I don't know if you guys have a say on that, but that's I probably would put him on the wing. Um, but we can have a debate on that. I think those are the two that are locked in for sure. And I think probably we'll all feel the same about the point guard spot too. Um, my feel is boo on that. I don't think I would take anybody else right now, but I am open to hearing what you guys have to say on that. Okay. Um, I have one, I don't want to get way too cute on this, but I do have a thing. (laughs) Okay. Are, are we sure that Terrence Shannon and Zach Eady work together? Because they're obviously, no doubt, the best two players in the league. And at, at some point, like, if we're picking eight guys, they have to be here. But if I'm thinking, like, a crunch time lineup in a one-possession game, this reminds me very much of Jaden Ivey, Zach Eady, which did not work at all. Eady was, like, very much in the way of Ivy and kind of limiting some of Ivy's special stuff. And, I, like... Shannon could play off ball. I don't worry about that in the half court. He's already doing that with the mask. I worry more so like, would we even utilize Shannon's freak transition gifts? If Zach ED needs half court touches every possession, I'm probably overthinking this. What do you think on that though? DK? Yeah, no, uh, for me, yes. I think they can both coexist. I think ED coming up and setting a screen. So TSJ can get downhill when there's nobody in the paint. I think that's pretty lethal. So I think I think you're overthinking it a little bit, and I think maybe TSJ does a little bit more off the bounce in the half court than Ivy could do. I just didn't think Ivy's handle was tight enough um, to be able to get to his spots, and I think that there's other roster issues around him kind of for that. There just wasn't enough spacing, I think, for them to, to coexist. So I think it'll be fine. Okay. All right. I'm good with that. Cart, any, anything to add to that, or are you good with that too? Is it cheating if we put TSJ at the four? Maybe not. I think there's a lot of good power forwards though. And I do want, I think that that's the most interesting position and I'm, I'm in, I'm excited to have that debate. So let's just hold off for that. And when we get to the spot, we can talk about it, but I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent against that, I guess. Okay. Okay. Shannon Edie locked in to point guard DK threw boo booey's name out. I've been screaming about boo Darius and my love for him for three years. Uh, The only other name I think belongs at all in the point guard conversation is probably not the name you guys I think I would guess. I kind of like Braden Smith as an option. I think that I like him too, and I want him coming off the bench as my guard piece of the bench. That's where I'm at with that. Because yeah. I think a pass-first type guy, and I want to surround everything else with shooting and him on the court. Um, and I think if you get a versatile piece that maybe you can play at the four or the five, and you can run a lineup out where it's five out with him on the floor, I think that'd be a lot of fun. And Boo could slide over to the two in some spots if you need to. You could you could play him off ball and just let him shoot and create too. So I like that. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I think I go Boo at the one. Right now, yeah. Just I think that 
his scoring ability right now and also his mentality. And I'm not to say that Braden doesn't have that killer mentality because I think he does. But also, like, this is sophomore Braden. Like, if we do the whole, like, if I get Braden two years from now or Braden next year, we probably pick him over Boo. Uh, but I think right now you just got to take Boo. What he does to make other players better um, and, like, you know, he, he he has like Ryan, the Ryan Langborgs of the world looking like they're really great Big Ten pieces. And that's not a shot at Langborg, but I'm just saying that Bowie, I think, makes a lot of players around him better. Yeah, for sure. Okay. As Braden does as well. Bra- there's something about just I, like, I think Braden is a, I don't know. It's the whole chicken or the egg thing of like, does Edie make Braden look better or is Braden actually so good at playing with Edie that he's helped elevate him? I think it goes both ways, but just something about like comfortability with Edie. Makes me want Braden on this team. But also, you you need a closer, too, G, with this team. Like, we love Braden, but we've also seen Braden, like, kind of fold in some moments like that uh, that he's had. He's also closed games as well, but, like, Boo's, like, one of the best closers in the country. Yeah, 100%. I have another closer on this team I'm going to want at some point. Uh, We'll get to that. Okay, so right now we have Boo Booey, Taryn Shannon, and Zach Eady locked into the starting lineup. We have Braden Smith locked into a spot off the bench. We have four more spots to fill, a shooting guard, a forward, and then three more bench spots. Uh, DK, why don't you take us where you want next? Um, Let's talk about, I guess let's maybe do the shooting guard spot because I think where you go with shooting guard is what you're going to end up doing at power forward. I think it would change it a little bit maybe. Um, I know he hasn't played. Uh, like particularly well you know he had 12 points in the first half I thought he looked more like himself last night in that first half and then he only scores two in the second I I don't quite know what's going on I don't know if it's injury related Um, I don't think that he looked like banged up last night I, I still think I would have Tyson at the two just from what we've seen but I guess at this point, um, that's, you know, it's open for debate the way that he's played the last month. So I don't know where you guys would go with that. I think I still would go with Tyson. He can play off Boo. He can be a spot-up shooter. I think they could get him a lot more looks. And, you know, if you want to move Boo off and and put Tyson as, you know, the secondary creator, I think that there's some interesting things you can do. Um, and I think that if he had a just a role where he became more of like a spot-up guy and then getting to the rim when he needs to, uh, I, I think that the game would look a little different. So I don't know where you guys would go with it, but um, I'm open open for debate. I think I would put Walker still on this team, uh, even despite the recent struggles. Hard, any thoughts? I have thoughts, but I don't want to go to war until I need to go to war. <laughs> uh, did we? Are we assuming everyone's healthy when doing this exercise? That's seems fair. Question. I okay. think that's, that seems fair because the groin is definitely like, I, well, see, right. that doesn't even affect me with this pick. I guess we'll talk about it when it gets there. But um, ah, it's kind of a small backcourt for sure with Bowie and Tyson. And Braden also, off the bench. like and, Yeah, we don't have any type of like – we need some size, I feel like, at the two. But also, I don't know where I would go, I guess, with this. Uh, I'm going to throw a name out because he's. I'm considering him for a bench piece. I know it's a little bit crazy. But Cam Christie deserves consideration to be on this team. I don't hate it at all. Um, he's got size. He's shooting the shit out of the ball this year. Yeah. Um, he's basically been everything that we were promised Max was going to be this year. He really, <laughs> he really has. It's really depressing to say that. But he's been a high-level shot maker. And, uh, I mean, he's just putting some points up on the board in the way he's been shooting the three. Um, I don't think it helps with your defense. That's maybe the one thing Max has had over him in his freshman year. Um, but he gives you size, and there's no doubt about the knockdown shooting ability from him either. When you ask health, are you going where I think you're going? You talking about me? Yeah. I I think so, yeah. Ty Berry? That's what I was going to say, yeah. It seems crazy in theory to say, like, give us Northwestern starting backcourt on the best case team. But, like, here, here's my thing. If this was a real basketball team and not just a thought exercise, you would essentially have your three usage guys already. Like, Shannon, Edie, and Boo are going to need to use so many possessions that everybody else that's on the court needs to serve a purpose that isn't having the ball in their hands. That's where, like, if Tyson, I think Tyson 100% deserves a spot on this team, but I actually think, like, 
part of Tyson's issues in Michigan State's issues this year have been that like he's best as a ball dominant guy and he's playing off the ball and it's a little bit clunky and it leads to a lot of like off the dribble twos that just isn't great. Like I, an off the dribble two from Tyson Walker on this team with Boo and Shannon and Edie would be a failure every single time he takes it. Now, it would be easier for him because he would get a lot of catch and shoot threes, but I think there's arguments there's better like specific role players within the concept of that lineup and have Tyson Hunt off the bench. That makes sense. He has to have a spot on the team. Some names that I would throw out as alternatives that go a bunch of different directions here. Uh, they, some of them get crazy, but Cam Christie yeah. level crazy. AJ Store I think, is the most talented shooting guard in the league, uh, but I don't love how he's been playing, and I don't know. There's questions there. I actually wouldn't hate a Ty Berry shout if we're playing the he's healthy game. If we're going the spacing and just shooting – Option. I think you have to at least mention Kise Tomonaga, extreme spacing for the other three guys, but defensive liability. And then the fourth one I would just name is if we wanted to go on like defense, maybe a little three in defense. He hit some threes yesterday. Sounds crazy, but maybe Ace Baldwin, bigger guard, if we wanted some size. Ace Baldwin and TSJ would be kind of killer and cover up for Boo. Hmm. What could Peyton Sanford get a shot at this spot? Mm. Sanford's not bad yeah he's been playing well as of late and like actually filling up the stat sheet which is crazy too like he's getting like NBA hype now which is insane to me we also Stor- haven't mentioned Stor- Jameer Young shooting four threes a game and he's shooting 30 percent that's my only thing if we're if we're talking yeah. about a guy where you want spacing around everybody else I don't know if he's the fit even though I agree with you he's probably you know the second best wing type behind TSJ in the conference yeah. I, so let's rule store out, at least for the starting spot. Um, I We have to at least mention Jameer Young, too. I, we're not going to pick him in the starting lineup due to fit, but like he's one of the most talented players left that we haven't even mentioned. So, uh, I, man, I don't know. Tyson's definitely the best player, but I still – like I don't think Tyson with those other three guys makes a better basketball team than either getting a defender at the two or like a sniper – off ball shooter. Tyson coming off the bench next to Braden is kind of fun. So yeah. I don't I don't hate that either. Um I, I still I'm like kind of caught up on the Cam Christie. I won't lie. I think it was he's <laughs> taking 5.3 three point shots a game. He's shooting 42%. Like he has size to rise up above it. Like I get the the Kese Tomanaga love, but like he doesn't give me guard. A guy that's a little bigger and longer and would fit everybody else I, I don't know i think cart might have a heart attack on screen if he's <laughs> brother that's the only thing i'd be i i think i'd be okay with christy or probably christy or barry but for me like i'm very high on barry but obviously i don't know if we, it just it feels weird saying that our starting backcourt is west or is northwestern's backcourt but at the is same there, time is there nobody else we're missing there's not right like I, like I, we named the Iowa guy, like I, oh, I mean Roddy Gale, Jameson Battle. Yeah, the Ohio State guys. We haven't talked to them. I'm gonna make a pitch for Battle at, at power forward in a minute. Oh. So that's oh. what I'm wait. <laughs> okay, we'll wait on that. I I will rule out Roddy Gale. I think Roddy Gale's been stinky lately. So, uh, uh, okay. this leaves us like okay, Sanford, Christie, Tominaga, Barry. This now I'm back to like we're just overthinking this shit. None of those guys are better than Tyson or AJ Store. <laughs> let's just let's pick Tyson. I want Tyson. Wait, oh, I didn't mention the other one. I didn't mention the other one. You're not gonna play this guy at the four. Size, Marcus Damask. At the two? Yeah. I mean, I'd, look, everyone on Illinois plays interpositionally, but like. You could you could move Shannon to the two, Damask at the three. Those guys are interchangeable. They're essentially playing that for Illinois right now. Damask is big. He is by far the best offensive player. The only thing is he's only shooting 29% from three on the season, and it's back to another ball-dominant guy. Honestly, I think DK talked me into Christie. I think I want Christie there. This is it, we, If we put Cam Christie in the starting lineup of this team, that's insane, guys. <laughs> that's insane. <laughs> I think if we're going Christie, I want Ty Berry, and then I'm I'll I'll go Christie off the bench if we still feel good about that. But isn't he like the isn't he like Minnesota's third leading scorer? 
Well, Dawson Garcia is great. Are we picking Dawson? I want to fact Dawson's check where Christie's at. Dawson's got to be talked about as well. We could have two Minnesota guys on this team. Just for the okay, okay, so Cam Christie is the second leading scorer on Minnesota. He's scoring 12 a game in conference play. He has been shooting the lights out. You're right. He essentially has been Max Christie, but revamped. Fuck, man. You, you guys pick Tyson Walker or Cam Christie. I'm going to let Cart decide. We he, we stuck ah. him with the first pick last time. He can ultimately decide. I'm okay. Great. Tyson, if, okay. if we pick Cam Christie, Tyson's off the bench. If we pick Tyson, I don't know that Christie's off the bench. Since you guys gave me the, the option to do this, I got to do the right thing. And the right thing is I'm not putting a Christie family member on my team. <laughs> so, I'm at least not starting. Like, I, I if I get control, I, I will be petty. So, Tyson. Okay. Tyson Walker, Boo Booey. Taryn Shannon and Zach Eady. Now we need another forward. DK, give us the nominations. Yeah. Okay. I think, man. So I definitely think there has to be some consideration for spacing next to Edie. I think still maybe that's the largest part. I know Mason Gills has given it a little bit, but I, I do think if they just had like a 30 minute per night guy next to him that could knock down threes, I think that the best shooting forward and that spot for that specific role is Jamison Battle. I'm just going to toss that out there. I think that the fit would make a ton of sense. I get you're not getting a ton defensively, and we're like, you know, the backcourt's a little bit shaky on that. Um, but you do have Zach Eady in the middle anchoring it down. I think that there should certainly be consideration for Dawson Garcia as well. Um, I You probably could talk about Coleman Hawkins in this mix as well. He's shooting the three at a much higher level than I thought he was going to this season. I, you know, I don't know how I feel about that one way or the other. I, I think sometimes the the basketball IQ is a little bit low and he drives me a little nuts. Um, trying to think of who else you would put at this spot. Those are the three that came to my mind. I don't know if anybody what, else. What about, uh, what about Nkamla? Yeah. He, it's hard with the injury he played through down the stretch and just how bad Michigan was, but his shooting started falling off a cliff late in the season. Okay. Um, you wouldn't consider Malik Hall? I think that there's some consideration. I just don't know if he shoots the three at a high enough volume. And what he does best, I think, is almost like a TKR role where they're so tight down there in the paint on the on each other that they're, you know, interfering with what you would want to do when Edie's down there. I think it, he's at his best when he operates in the mid post as well. Um, and so if you went that route, wouldn't you maybe prefer somebody who's a little more versatile, like Damask that can maybe score and get to his spots himself. Um, I mean, I think, I think Malik Hall has been really, really consistent basically since the turn of the calendar. So he, he certainly should be in the conversation, but I just, let me pull up the, the battle numbers for you. Hold on one minute. <laughs> They're oh, stupid. I know that. Yeah. So I, I want to rule out Coleman at this spot because I think what Coleman brings, we don't necessarily need with the team we have, right? Like I, the one of the good parts about Coleman is that he has some like initiate the offense type things. But I think with everybody on the floor, we don't really need that. Like we have Boo creating, we have Tyson at the two, and also Coleman doesn't check anybody. And I'm I'm sick of acting like he does. So it between, yeah, so it, it'd be between six point four three game. attempts a game, and he's shooting forty three percent. Jameson Battle. Like you are getting the best shooter at that spot and you're just telling him, listen, dude, we don't need to do anything but shoot the three. Like he could take 10 threes a game on this team and you'd be probably be pretty happy with every shot that he took. He can rise up in the spots. Um, you could run some pick and pop stuff for him. He could just be sitting in the corners. The other guys create and pulling up. I, I think that fit wise, he probably makes a little bit more sense. Then Dawson Garcia, I probably would put Dawson on the bench then if you were to do that because you could play him maybe at the five in some spots and you'd have some versatility if you wanted to uh, play somebody else. But uh, I'm I'm open to debate on that. I think that those are the two guys I would consider for the spot. Okay. Hmm. It, doesn't it just feel weird that Jameson Battle is our pick? Yeah, my biggest issue with battle is nothing battle has done this year. And this is a little harsh, but I, I think my biggest issue with battle is right now everyone that's on the team I would consider a winning player. Like just every every step of the way they've been involved in winning basketball habits. J 
Jamison Battle has never. Like, and I know it's not his fault, but he was like an all Big Ten player at Minnesota when they were horrendous. Then he left Minnesota and they got good. And then he went to Ohio State and they stayed horrendous and their coach got fired. So I think like as a fifth option, that's overthinking it. And he's definitely the best offensive threat there. He would open everything up for Edie. I'll let you guys go whatever way you want on this. I like battle more than Garcia. If if we're just talking like the roster fit, my only pitch on a different guy is one you mentioned and cart wrote him off. I like Coleman more than I like battle. And I know there's all the problems with Coleman and there's shit with him. Here's my pitch. I think if if we were actually trying to build an eight man roster to win a national title, you could do that by doing two things that I think would give you the best chance. Path one is surround Zach Eady with shooters. So off our bench, we need like Tomanaga and Battle and Braden Smith to, to just do Purdue, but with even better shooters than Lance Jones and Fletcher Lawyer. Unbeatable. Uh, then option two is. Basically, Illinois' roster build, but with some better players on the perimeter, maybe like a real big and a real point guard, right? Like, Illinois' wings are insane. It's the whole reason they're so good and the mismatch stuff. We could still do – like, I think this team, if we're picking eight guys, it has to have at least two Illinois guys on it. And we have Shannon. So it's either Hawkins or Damask. And to me, Hawkins is the more versatile. I get it. Like, their defense is horrible. I don't think it's Coleman's fault. I think he's a part of it, but – He's guarding out of position because they don't have a true big. If Coleman was guarding the four, we have a couple years of evidence of Coleman being one of the best four defenders in the league. So um, I don't know. I'll let you guys pick. I'm fine with it either way. But I, I think the end objective based on what we do here has to be to do both of those builds. Give me two Illinois guys and then also give me the shooters around eating. Mm, okay. I think I'm ga- I'm more game for Coleman over – Dawson and Jameson, I think. I'm fine with it. I, it hurts me a little bit just because I, I felt like I've taken a strong stance over the years, but I do think Hawkins has been better. I mean, the, the three-point shooting to me is the difference, right? If he was still shooting 30%, this wouldn't be a conversation. He's taken almost five a game this year, and he's shooting just under 40%. That's the game changer for him. That, to me, was always the biggest, the biggest flaw of his game. He took four threes last year, and he shot 28%. You can't do that. And now he's hitting almost 40%. He's taking almost five a game. That kind of changes it. 1.7 steals, 1.1 blocks. Like he's just a big, long athlete that I think would really clog stuff up defensively too. I I think between ED, him, and TSJ, you kind of make up for maybe some of the defensive deficiencies that you have at the one and the two where, yeah, maybe some ball pressure, but not really like stoppers, obviously, for Walker or Bowie. So, yeah, uh, I'm fine with it. I think you can go Hawkins, and I think it's – it's. I mean, it's a fun fit, I think. And I, flipping that too, like Edie and Bowie slash Tyson give Shannon and Hawkins everything this Illinois team is currently lacking, right? Like there's a real rim protector. Tyson's a guy who can go get in your shit on the perimeter – Quickness wise, like that's, I would have no defensive concerns about Shannon and Hawkins on this team, and the offense is going to take care of itself. So I think that's the right pick. Okay. So the starting five, Boo Booey, Tyson Walker, even though we've really considered some crazier options there, uh, Taryn Shannon, Coleman Hawkins, and Zach Eady. Right now we have Braden Smith as our backup point guard. We need to fill two more spots. What do you guys want to do? Hmm. I, I like shoot. I like battle. Yeah, I think it's got to be. I do shoot. too. So I like. I would like battle. I. I don't. I don't even know if I want Kise off the bench though. I, I just want straight. Sh- I want shooters, but I don't know. Kise, I feel like he has to start and gun, and I just don't think that works. Do we need? We probably. We probably need a backup big, right? Like Dane. Well, I guess Coleman could slide over and play the five. Said but... Dane. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> It'd be good. Um, do we need a backup big? Because you could play Coleman at the five. Ah, we've seen what that looks like. Yeah, true. I don't know. I honestly, I wouldn't like mind just grabbing like a backup big that's like pretty versatile, like a Malik Renault. Yeah, we haven't mentioned an Indiana player once yet. Yeah, that's kind of wild. Um, I mean, they don't really yeah, give us I mean, any options. I, I still think Malik's best spot could end up being at center. Could he like play with some of the guys? Like, is he going to defend Zach Eady? No, but he's already on the team, so you don't have to worry about that. Right, and I think he's play a, the four, he's the a five, good, he's a good passer. You could put him at the four, five if you wanted to. Like, he's a good defender. Like, 
He's had games this year where he's putting up like 25 and 5. Like he's got that type of ability. Yeah, I don't hate that at all. He's been good. Um, and, and the Hoosiers would appreciate it. <laughs> the Hoosiers. You, the Hoosier faithful. Yeah, he's taking one and a half threes a game, 34%. He's averaging 16 and six with two and a half assists. That's pretty good. It's not bad. Uh, I think bad. Only only other big worth mentioning, I think, is Cliff, if we just wanted like pure defensive stopper. But I don't think this team needs that necessarily. Nah, I think I'm good. I think I think I'll go on like team. Dawson being any type of defensive guy. You just don't think he's a good defensive guy. Because I do eh. think like, if you're talking about a versatile four slash five guy that you could throw in there and mix the lineups in. I mean, he's That's clearly true. a guy that can go get you a bucket in a variety yeah. of different ways. He is six ten too, so he's got size. And he can shoot he, a little bit. In yeah. The Illinois game, what did he have? He had 22, something like that. He had 29. Yeah. 29 we, was it more. Do we go Dawson Garcia Jameson battle final two spots? Guys that can kind of slide around and just versatile pieces that can both shoot a little bit. Jameson a lot of bit. I'm with that. I like that. Yeah, I do too. I'd be okay with it. I think that's good. And the only thing that feels icky to me at the end of this with that eight is we already have two Illinois guys, but I we left the mask off. <laughs> He's really good. He's he really is, good. He is very good. But mm. that's a lot of guys. It's a lot of Illinois guys to put oh. in the top eight. I know we love Braden. Tyson can play the one too. Do we sub Braden out for Damask? Uh. I wouldn't do it because I I think you know I, I I think you could put Braden in you could take out either Walker or Bowie at some point and I don't know I I I just think Braden is on the rise right now yeah. he just absolutely destroyed Michigan State last night so maybe I'm a prisoner of the moment but like uh he's not that dude's that dude's when, you know when I'm, he's I'm, hitting when he's hitting like the you know mid-range pull-up when he's pulling up from the elbow and hitting that shot the way that he shot the three this year and the way that he can get in the paint like just tough too tough nope. big 10 big 10 is just really good some play some good players get left out sorry to mask <laughs> i'm sorry this <laughs> yeah it's about to be brayden's league we gotta leave him okay so the final roster uh we already said the starters but just to repeat boo booey tyson walker Taryn shannon coleman hawkins zach Eady off the bench brayden smith jameson battle and dawson garcia think that's good it's a versatile group uh around the horn one word answer does that team win six consecutive games in march slash i guess we got to know who's coaching them right are we well actually yeah. you know what that's a that's a good question for the two of y'all would you still have <laughs> tom Izzo coach this team at this point over i get the the only other answer has to be painter it has to be but Payne is one of the worst March guys ever. Like, <laughs> I want Underwood coaching my team. You'd pick Brad? Yeah. I don't know about yeah. that in March. Yeah, I don't know about that either. I think it's, it, it, to me, it's Painter or Izzo. Either you believe in the March shit with Iz or you don't and you pick Painter. This is like such a complicated answer given the way the last <laughs> few years have gone. So fuck you, Greg. For, I'm, for sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Still... Let's we will say this for this exercise. We're not playing a whole season with this team. We're not. We're not trying to get the one seed. We're just yeah. going right into March Madness and it's win six games. I think that with the talent on the roster, there's just no way to fumble any of the rotations or like sitting guys are not like figuring that out like there's just it's just all talent mm -hmm. so for me i'll still stick with Izzo. i i think he's you know he's proven he's still the best coach i think i think the four years mostly on his shoulders has been the talent on the roster and the willingness to stick with guys who just just don't have it and i think i think he's still the best coach in the conference even though he hasn't shown it the last four years all right you agree I want Brad coaching my team. <laughs> uh, as long as you you guarantee me there's only eight players and there isn't four more bench guys that we don't know. I agree, <laughs> I agree with DK. It's Michigan State. It's Tom Izzo. Um, if it's Painter versus Izzo, that is. I'm taking Izzo. If it's Izzo versus everybody, maybe wouldn't the best coach of this team be no coach, which would mean 
Jawan Howard, who, by the way, as long you you put him in the tournament, he's never had a problem there. You just no. got to get him to the tournament. No. But we're already in the tournament. Okay. All right. No, absolutely not. I'm Tom, not Izzo's, Tom Izzo's the coach around the horn. Does that team win a national championship, yes or no? No. <laughs> <laughs> this year, I think they do. I think it's uh, I think it's UConn versus this team. I think that they could get over the hump with this team. It would be fun if we could like simulate this team with Izzo coaching it versus Purdue with Painter coaching them. I'd love to know what that is. Uh, I think this team would win, but I just I want to know how close it would be. I think this team would win a national title. I'm not going to overthink it. This is I think that team would lose in the Sweet 16. That's crazy. (laughs) All right. Final topic today. This has been a great episode. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this as much as we are doing this. Uh, Okay. I want to know from DK himself exactly what his offseason agenda would be if he was the head coach of Michigan State basketball and he was tasked with revamping this program. Obviously, there's still a young core that we are excited about. We still believe in Jeremy Fears. We definitely believe in Xavier Booker. Cohen Carr has shown things and is a very exciting player. I think Garrick Norman even deserves mention as a part of that. This recruiting class coming in is not bad by any means. McCulloch, Jace Richardson, and Kurtang all either project as guys who will impact this program down the line or could potentially do it immediately. But in the short term, there are a lot of questions. You're going to lose Tyson Walker and Malik Hall. You, in theory, will lose A.J. Hogarth and Mati Sissoko, but there is, uh, without knowing behind the scenes what's going on, there is the option for them to return. And then there are a bunch of other players on this roster that you probably would like to maybe change that or at least make them different versions of themselves. So, DK, for this exercise's uh, purposes, I think a big part of this has to be like what happens at the end of this year. So let's yeah. just say, like Michigan State okay. makes. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Sorry, sorry. Michigan State makes the tournament, and they lose their first game. Just for the, like, because I want to prompt you to like not be feeling great about things, because I think that's where the the emotional status is right now. So let's just say they make the tournament, lose as like a ten seed or a nine seed in the first round game. What would be your agenda this offseason to try and revamp Michigan State basketball? So it's what I would do, not what I think Tom Izzo would do. What you would do. What's your plan of attack? So you thank Tyson and Hall for showing up for most of the season. That's part of it. Um, you tell AJ and Maddie, appreciate it, guys, four years. Um, you know, that's it. The the course of your scholarships run. Um, you know, if you need to go transfer somewhere or you're going to go play overseas or whatever, that's fine. But we're turning the page on that. So you clear out those four guys. Um, I think that you have to figure out what you want to do with Xavier Booker. Is he a four or is he a five? I I don't know the answer to that. I I think that the way that you attack the portal depends on who who is entering into it. I think you probably need to still get a center. Um, I, I think that if you played Xavier Booker 25 minutes a night at center spot, I think that there's certain matchups where it would be difficult, even though I think offensively it works really well. I would more like to see him moonlight at the center spot. So that's how I generally feel. So I think I would lean towards going into the portal and getting a center. If they don't and they choose to get a guy at the power forward spot, he needs to be good. Like they need to go get a really good guy at that spot. I think that you need to have him be able to stretch it a little bit um for when you're playing your backup traditional center and I think you know when you look up and down this roster the question marks for Akins does he come back or not does he maybe portal does is he just done I think that that's the biggest kind of linchpin in the way that maybe you look at where the wing's going I get concerned again this is what I would do I, Holloman's still got to come off the bench for me I think that he's shown some stuff. He hit two threes yesterday. He had that nice layup and take and finish. I think he's shown some flashes. He's probably the one guy that you're circling this year where you said like, okay, there's a pretty significant step when you've seen the upside for him. But to me, he's still probably more like your seventh guy on the rotation. You know, he's coming off the bench for it. 
So I would, I would go and get a bigger wing forward type. Um, and I would go and get a center. I think that those are the two spots. I would play book primarily at the four. I think that's probably his best spot. You protect him a little bit more. And I think that if he plays the minutes that he's going to have, given the strength that he's put on this year and where he's kind of come in some of his development, my personal feel is regardless of what happens, I think Xavier Booker is gone after next year. If you're able to retain him after this offseason, which – I think it's trending towards you will. I think that he's done. I think he probably goes to the NBA. So you only get one year with him. And if you're looking at it in that scope, I think you have to protect him with a center. And I think you have to maximize what he does best, which is the pick and pop stuff and, and playing more on the perimeter than he would into the paint. So go out and get a center, somebody that can go give you 10 and eight. It doesn't even have to be a guy that's like an absolute monster, but somebody that plays two ways. You can play for 25 minutes per night. And, and is just going to lock down that spot on both ends for you, capable of making a layup of catching the ball and playing some defense on that end. And then I think you got to go and get a bigger wing. I think that the three guard lineup in theory was potentially a good idea. We've seen some teams do it. I think that Michigan state has just lacked some size. You, you've been worried about some of the rebounding over the last four years. I think really since Aaron Henry kind of left that spot, those wing spots, they just haven't had a good enough rebounder. So for me, Go out and find a bigger wing that you could play at the three. It's sometimes the four that can knock down a three and defend. So go out, get two guys. Um, you, you have to ride with fears. I, I listened to some of what you guys have talked about. I understand your perspective. I think you just got to rock with fears. He's the future. You got to build on that. Hopefully you have Aiken starting at the two spot. And then, you know, at the wing, you have Norman coming off a red shirt. You don't know what that's going to look like. I think Kurtang can definitely contribute next year. To me, he looks pretty polished. The frame is already there. Uh, and I think you just kind of have to build it out there. But you you get two pieces and then you proceed forward to that. And I, I don't know how good of a team that is. It depends on what kind of pieces you get and who enters the portal. But I think that the floor become much safer. And I think you can start to build towards – uh, an upward trajectory right now we've kind of gone down and then it's plateaued and we've kind of stayed at this level where we're, we're flirting between a seven and 10 seed. I'm okay. If next year's team was closer to a six or a seven seed, if you're showing me that the trajectory is going up instead of plateauing or staying down. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. You got to aggressively attack the portal. You have to turn the page on this group who just unfortunately has not been a winning group. And you have to kind of turn over some of this to the youth and, and see what it is. But I think you just got to start fresh at this point. You can't bring back any of the extra baggage, which you've been carrying for the, the last four years. Seems like there's a good chance that could actually happen too. I have a bunch of very pointed follow-up questions to all of this, because I think this stuff fascinates me. Like just the fact that this is college basketball now, and it's so different than where it was four years ago. Like the, the old solution would have just been like, you better land a good recruiting class. That's it. Or like develop your play. That's what Tom Izzo was good at. And now it's like, there's all these creative solutions to go from bad to good by snapping a finger. If you are willing to do them, it seems like Tom's hand is going to be forced to doing it, but your plan is along the lines of what I would do. Maybe with some slight tweaks. I have three very pointed questions. I will get to after I throw to Carter, Carter, your thoughts on all this. Do you agree? Do you disagree? What would you do different? I agree. And I think that, for me, there's there's some there's a non-negotiable in in all of this, and the non-negotiable well one is the guys moving on. Like the guys have to move on, uh, and that and when I say guys, that's AJ Mahdi. Like, thank you for everything, but it's like like DK said, it's time to move on from that. With that said, uh, DK actually posed a question to me in text last week that I think kind of means is is what the most important thing is. Are you going to what are you going to do with Booker? If you're going to make Booker the five, that's fine, but that's going to change what we prioritize in the portal. Um, and for me, it is you established that their backcourt is Jeremy Fears and Jay Nakins, and you know that off rip. I think that the Jay Nakins at the three experiment, I'm kind of just over that. I think we need a bigger playmaking wing that can shoot the ball as well. And there's plenty of out there. I've already looked at a lot of options and DM'd a lot of people in my tampering bag. Um, but yeah, I just think that, you know, as you look across the league to 
no one really does the undersized three guard thing unless it's just that dynamic. Like, you know, those Baylor teams of the past, they did it, but they had three NBA players that were doing that, you know? So it's just, there's a lot of moves to be made. Um, Obviously Jeremy fears development was stunted this year by the tragic accident. Um, So I'm kind of in the same camp as DK. It might not even look that great early on next year, but you just, it's, he is, he's going to be our point. Like we're putting all of our eggs in that basket. And I feel a lot better about putting my eggs in that basket than we did when we put the eggs in the AJ Hogarth basket. I think it's going to end differently. So, um, yeah, I, I do agree with DK though. I think that you have to do something in the front court. Now, is, is that a four or a five? I don't know, but something must be done in the back court. And then hopefully, you know, uh, sorry, the front court, and then hopefully, guys in the backcourt develop and you know the one good thing is that Trey Holloman has actually shown some improvement like DK said but on a really good basketball team I think like Trey Holloman is like your seventh guy eighth guy maybe even and he can give you good minutes in a short spurt but I, I'm not on board with the uh you know maybe him starting Trey next year I think that'll be an indictment of guys how guys have developed in the backcourt if you play the three guard lineup and you're replacing Walker with Akins and Holloman, you know, with with fears with Hogard, which I think is an upgrade, but maybe not on. I don't know if it will be on paper per se. I guess stat wise, at least, I I don't know that. Like leadership wise, no doubt. But then you're sliding Akins up to the Walker spot, and you're playing Holloman in, instead of Aiken. Like that's not an upgrade. That's not an upgrade in any measure to me. So you have to go out and get a big wing because. Otherwise, you're you're running back the same philosophy with with lesser talent. Yeah. Uh, on the Holloman point, just quickly, he's a guy who strikes me as like a great elite almost bench guy for his final two years. Like if he if he is just sixth man type, he's one of the best in the sport. If you're stretching him and being like, that's our starting shooting guard, I think it leaves a lot to be desired. And that's no disrespect to him because this is a critical role for a lot of teams. But um, you you always want better players as shitty as it is. The players don't want this. It's gotten harder in the portal era. You want better players playing roles that are comfortable for them or even too small for them. Like that's what good teams have is they have so much talent that sometimes there's a little bit of a squeeze out, not the opposite where you're stretching untalented guys into bigger roles out of necessity Um, on fears. I, here's the first of my three questions for DK. I'll try to be kind of quick on this. Um, I understand why Michigan state fans view him as the next face of this program. I buy it. I buy the leadership stuff. I bought the player as a high school kid. Like Cart knows this. I compared him to Trey Burke off the film I watched. I think very highly of his game. I think this season, had he played the full season, I think he would have ended up very good and maybe pushed AJ for real on court minutes. Um, the reality is that the the question of what he's going to be coming back from this is crazy. And thank God it wasn't a more serious injury, but That's a long time without playing serious basketball to suddenly have to go play 35 minutes a game as a starting point guard. Um, I I'm not advocating you go get a guy to replace fears, but if you go through the top 10 teams in the country, seven of them this season brought in a transfer guard in one of their two guard spots. And I think all 10 of them, we would say have a superstar guard in some form this year. Like, that's go through Houston, LJ Cryer, UConn, Tristan Newton. Purdue has a superstar in Braden, and they brought in Lance Jones. Arizona, Caleb Love. Tennessee, I'm counting Connect as a guard. If you want to say that's just their backcourt without him, fine. Jordan Ganey was a transfer off the bench. Auburn has a bunch of transfer guards. Duke's the only team to do it with just high schoolers, but they've had five-star blue chip types. Alabama, Mark Sears. North Carolina had a reclassify in Cadeau. And R.J. Davis was North Carolina grown, so no transfers there. Uh, And then Iowa State, Gilbert's a transfer, and they hit the jackpot with Lipsy. Of those 10 teams, Lipsy is the one that reminds me the most of, like, Fears' trajectory standpoint. It's like, oh, underwhelming kind of three-star kid, although Fears was a higher-ranked recruit. But by year two, he's a superstar, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's realistic for fears in year two. And you you just kind of alluded to it, DK, of like, you know, we we like him culture-wise. It's such an upgrade from Hogard. We don't know if he's going to be a better player than Hogard next year. And if it's him and Akins, if that's the if that's the backcourt you're supposed to sell me on, like, next year the team's competitive, 
I don't think that's a good enough backcourt. I don't. It's not about anything else. It's just like the caliber wise. Like we're we're going on the problem of this year being yes, it's the center spot, but also like Tom kept, just said it last night. The guards aren't as good as they're supposed to be. Part of that's Tyson's injury. Part of it's AJ. Part of it's Jade Nakins. So, do you actually think that Jeremy Fears and Jade Nakins as a combination are good enough to be a top ten team starting backcourt next year? No, I don't, but I think that you're at a spot and it sucks because of the way that the last four years have gone that you're in this, but I think that this is this is a rebuild year. I don't know how else you can say it. You're losing a bunch of your top scoring. You're losing a bunch of veterans. This is a rebuilding year. And in this day and age, I don't think you could go out and get another point guard and keep Jeremy Fears in the fold. That's just not the way that it works. So, you know, if he doesn't quite live up to the billing, I guess you do have Trey Howellman potentially backing that up. I, I'm more of the thought that Jace Richardson is going to need a couple years of seasoning. I think particularly for his body frame, he, he's probably going to need to put on 15, 20 pounds this offseason to really contribute in year one. And I, I don't know if his frame is capable of doing that or not. I don't necessarily disagree with you. I don't think that this lines up for Michigan State you know, being a top 10 or 15 team next year. And I know the fans don't want to hear that after the struggles that we've had. But I think that when you're looking towards the future, I think it's still, you've got to figure it out with Jeremy because of all the intangibles. I still think that there's more offensively that he's capable of giving it. And we saw it in some spurts during the course of the 12 games that he played. It's just so hard to predict where that's going to go for him, you know, what kind of offensive player he's going to be. But I think that you have to explore it. And so the, the short of the answer is no, it's not a top 10 backcourt. But I think that it's most important to get Jeremy Fierce heading in the right direction, because if you can solidify the point guard spot, which has been a problem since Cassius Winston left, I think that you can start building the program back in the right direction. So for me, you have to push all your chips in with Jeremy and then you kind of just got to see it unfold. And if next year becomes more of a rebuild year, but we're starting to see the glimpses of maybe what he can be as an upperclassman. I'm okay with that. As long as everybody else is moving in the same direction, you're getting good curtailing minutes. Garrick Norman plays well, you figure out what you're going to do with Carr, particularly in the half court offense. I think some of the pieces that are going to be around for the next couple of years have to move with him in the right direction. But I think ultimately uh, you have to just ride out with fears and, and see where it takes you. Okay, here's here's my flip because I agree with the what, that's better for the long term trajectory. My only flip I would make on this, uh, I think you could do both, where it's like a reload while you're also handing the keys to fears and playing for the future. The reason I would advocate trying to do both is if you actually only have one more year of Xavier Booker. I think it would be a massive waste of having one more year of Xavier Booker and viewing that as a rebuild year. Like, I, I don't think you want to be worrying about who your center is in the junior year of Jeremy fears, replacing an NBA guy. So what I would do, the only tweak that I think is really doable. And this was going to be my second question to you. Uh, you don't have to go get a point guard. You don't have to get a guy to replace fears, but you can get a starter level. I don't know who to make a comparison to, but like, like what UConn just did with Cam Spencer, Go get a star. Go get a star guard for one year that I, I it, maybe that pisses Jaden Akins off. Maybe. But Jaden also played the three and signed up for that this year. Jaden's going to have his own choices anyway, as you alluded to. I don't think Jaden's play this year has necessarily warranted giving him any sort of leash. Um, and the, the second question I was going to ask is, what if Jaden Akins comes back and has some NIL demands? I don't know how that kid is wired, but... I do know, like, if Aikens was going to be a portal guy, I'd assume there's a price tag associated with his name. If you're Michigan State and Aikens comes back being like, yeah, I want some money to come back, is that something you would even entertain giving him at this point versus going the other route of just going and getting a better player than Jay Aikens? I'd like to hear Cart's thoughts on this. So I think what you're basically posing is if you had the option to replace Aikens with – a star caliber type two guard would you do it i mean that's kind of what you're asking are you, uh, are, you are we under the assumption that we would also still get a wing because that doesn't really solve that problem so you're saying go get three guys in the portal 
not two. I, again, this is not at all what will Tom Izzo do. We know he's not going to do this, or at least we right. think. Um, what would I do if I had the keys to the Michigan State program? I think this thing needs a total talent overhaul. I just think it does. Like I, I no no disrespect to the sophomore class who's combining for what seventeen minutes a game right now, and that's just in the last week when he started playing Xavier Booker. <laughs> like I, I, we don't know if any of these guys are even good college basketball players. We just don't. We want them to be. Um, Jay Nakins this year has massively underwhelmed from what we all thought he could be. And I don't necessarily put it all on him because I, I still think he's being asked to play a role that's not best to show what he can do. And if he was the starting shooting guard next to Jeremy Fears next year, he might look like a totally different player. But I think this team needs star power somewhere. And if you if you are building around Booker and Fears, to me, it, it's got to come at the expense of somebody. Maybe it doesn't have to be Bacons. Maybe it could be a three next to him, but... I just I would go hunting best player available. And if that comes at the expense of Jade Nakin, so be it. Cart, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think at this point I would be willing to do that. Just because like to, I, I think a point you brought up, Greg, is that, you know, maybe that one guy, maybe that guy you bring in is not as it doesn't play as much or is not as good because Jay Nakins takes a step, but that's just kind of what basketball is. So like you had that. And if you think about it. One of the big things for Jay Nick is next year is that one, it's a lot of projecting that he's going to be good at the two. I think he's had just objectively a bad year. I don't think he got better this season from what he was last season. I think he's gotten worse. So he, him playing next to the two now would also affect Jeremy. Fe like imagine if, 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 Jay Nickens does not get better at the two. And he's also not gonna one is gonna hurt the team. It's also, I think, gonna hinder Jeremy Fears not having a guard next to him that can take a little bit of pressure off of him. So, you know, is that a like you brought up DK? Is it a wing that comes and brings the pressure off? Or I would be completely willing to go out and get a starting caliber guard if it comes at the expense of Jay Nakins, especially if the scenario comes in that he comes demanded NIL. I would say, I would wait, what do you want your increase to be? 20k. I'm going to take that 20K and I'm going to go see what's available and then I'll get back to you. Like, that's kind of where I would go. I would be at with that. Word. Okay. And that, look, I'm not, I don't mean to project what Jay Nakins is going to do. By all accounts, he seems like a great program guy who has already sacrificed to try and make things work in Michigan State. Um, I'm just a, like, if I, if I were a player in this day and age for sure, and it was like, hey, this wasn't a great year for me individually. I'm sought after. We do know like uh, there are programs that would pay him, right? That would that would pull him away. Um if that's a realistic outcome, I think Michigan State could be better served rather than paying Jay Nakins if it comes to that. Um I had one more question. I'm trying to remember what it is. I think I might have merged it together with Xavier Booker's return being his final year and the Jay Nakins one. Um I'll I'll end with this cuz we've been long-winded. What do you think Tom Izzo actually does, DK? Just summarize at high level for us. All right. I think for sure they go out and they try to get some type of wing forward. I think that that will happen. They will add at least one body next year. But my concern is that the half measure is not good enough. And I, I think that this is the largest off season that the program has faced uh, under Izzo's tenure. I think that you know, the concerns about the way that it's gone, maybe some of the rotations running, how he handled some of the freshman minutes this year. I think all the criticism has been pretty fair, particularly given, you know, the what we've seen in the last couple of games from Xavier Booker. Um, I, I think that this is, we're on the precipice and uh, it's, it's a scary place to be. You don't want him to go out sad. Um, you know, I wrote a rather long article and I think that the saddest thing that could happen towards the end of his career is to tarnish what he built, you know, for 25 years by having the fan base become just both discontent, but just having apathy, like the, the lack of caring about where the program's headed. I think that that's the most dangerous part that we're entering now, because I think towards the end of this, I think that you can feel the momentum shifting that everybody's just kind of ready for this season to be done. I think that for a couple of the individual players, I would like the streak to continue. Um, but it's hard for me, given the way that this year has gone to like openly root for the streak to continue when maybe the shock of, 
the change that would occur if they miss it is there. So it's really, you're kind of trapped in between two spots. So it's, he, he's got to go out and he's got to be ferocious and he's got to go get talent in the portal. And it's got to be at least two guys. And if he fails to do that, like even myself as a die, die hard, I think that I would just have to take a step back and remove myself like emotionally from the way that it's gone the last four years. If we, I, I'll always watch, I'll always root for these guys, but this is it. And if there's no urgency on the part of the staff and there's not as much caring, I don't, it's not that they don't care, but care enough to make the changes that are needed. If he's not willing to do that, how is I as a fan can continue to give everything that I have to the program. And that's, that's kind of where I'm at with it. So I think they're going to go get one body. I think that they have to get two. And I think that the half measure would really speak to this, just the ending, not going to be what he wants it to be. I I don't know how else to say it. I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words here, but if he doesn't go out and do what he needs to this year, it feels to me like it's kind of, this is it. Like I, there's no other second chances. This is the off season. Go out and do what you need to do to turn the program around. And if you are not willing to do that, then we're just all riding along until you decide to retire. And that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's well said. Um, Car, anything you want to add quickly and then we'll wrap. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's what's going to happen. Um, my Sissoko is going to be starting for this team next year. They are. It, 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 I would put it at a 79% chance that Madi's our starting center next year. Uh, and I do think he gets one body. Um, I think he's more likely to get a wing than anybody, like a, a wing guard type over a big, but Madi's coming back and he's, he's going to play. It's possible. I would be pretty shocked. I don't know. I, 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 it's not out of the realm of possibility. But if it happens, then that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look, the minutes are trending otherwise. Um, not the minutes are the end all be all, but at least I, I didn't think we would live in a world where he's playing like five, six minutes a game, and that's been consistent over the last week and a half. I think it's clear to everyone involved there needs to be change. Uh, look, all the doom and gloom aside, um. I know I've been very pointed in criticism of Tom Izzo through the years. One thing I will never criticize of the man is I don't think he's stupid. Like so there's a difference between the mistakes he's making right now that are due to loyalty and thinking that he could get these guys developed and become better players. Um, I don't think he's stupid. And I think this is the breaking point as DK alluded to the pressure will be on him this off season in a way it hasn't been the last two years. He has cost himself the ability to pull the loyalty card. If he does that one more time, there will be uh, revolting. And that wasn't the case the last two years. So we'll see what happens. Uh, DK, thanks so much for being here. We end every episode with one big thing presented by Big B. So uh, let's let's end the show with that. We always throw it to our guests first. What's your one big thing today, DK? Oh, can we slide it to cart first? Because I, I honestly didn't think about what I was going to say for this. So slide it to cart and then let me g- give me a minute. And then I'll sure. come up with something. Sure. Okay. Also want to make a uh an assumption here. I feel like DK doesn't drink coffee. <laughs> this is true. I'm a I'm a Zen <laughs> tinner kind of guy. Oh, I, I get I get my do I know my guy or do I know my guy? I know my guy. Uh okay. My one big thing. Uh do, 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 do. what do I want to do. I actually want to do it somewhat Michigan State related here. And it's it's on the topic of what DK said. And I just want to make it very clear to everyone out there, because sometimes I feel like I get the, oh, Carter, you're a fake fan. You're a fair weather fan, da, 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 da this, this, that, and the third. One thing that will never, ever change is that I'm, I'm, I'm going to support this program. Like, I'm going to turn on the games. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to cheer for, my like, the guys on the court to win the game. Am I frustrated with how the last four years have gone? Yes, I am. Like, I, I feel like it's okay to be frustrated with that. Um, And honestly, I feel like more people should be frustrated about it. But at the end of the day, I bleed green and white for better or for worse. This team could be University of Detroit level mercy bad next season. I'm still going to turn it. I'm still going to turn on the games and like watch the basketball game. So I just want that to be to be very much known. Hmm. 
Thank you for that. I endorse that message as I get set to watch my eight win basketball team suit up today, this afternoon against Ohio state. Uh, I have one little thing and then one big thing. My one little thing is car. Every episode, it seems like these days you drop a da, 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 as you're thinking about something. And I think it's rather cute. It's one of my favorite things that you do. I need to stop that then. Yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, the one big thing for me is I went to Red Robin today. Uh, I had a big betting win over the weekend. I was joking. Like the one thing my family's going to do when we win some money is go straight to Red Robin. So I uh, just want to shout out Red Robin. I think it's a top five chain restaurant. And I, I at some point on the show, I would like to go through our collective top fives for that. But uh, it, it belongs up there in the pedestal with like the Applebee's and the chilies of the world. Bottomless fries slap. Thank you, Red Robin. DK, what's your one big thing? Yeah, so there's a time where a movie can just transcend time and space, where it's so beautiful that the adaptation from the book is so perfectly done that visually it's unbelievable. The score is incredible that they cast it perfectly. And I have to tell you guys, I'm a nerd, like a sci-fi fantasy. I'm, I'm all up in that. But Dune 2 was hands down the best movie I've seen a theater in, I don't know, a decade. It wow. was unbelievable. Um, so I don't know if you guys rock with that or not, but I highly recommend watching the first so it can bridge you to the second. But I, I thought that what they did on the big screen this past weekend was uh, I'm going to go see it again probably within a week. It was It was that good. So if you haven't seen it, I think it's worth it, even if it's not your genre or pre preferred taste. I think it was just an absolute masterpiece on the screen. So my one big thing is uh, go see Dune 2. It'll blow your mind. Do you have to watch the first one before you go see 2? I think it would make sense. Yeah, and you can find it free. I think they just took it off Netflix at the end of this last month, but I think you can still find it. I, I would recommend watching the first one and then going to watch the second because it'll make a lot more sense for you, but... Yeah, I mean, nice. the way that they shoot it, the way that he used colors, like, oh, my God, it was it was really good. It's really good. I love this. I would love to unpack more things about DK's under the cover personality here. Like, let's get some non basketball <laughs> subjects from DK. This is great. Uh, OK, great show today. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll be back tomorrow on the Sleepers podcast. Have a great